Good evening. I'd like to call to order the March 1st planning regular planning commission meeting if we could have a call to order. Uh, that's my job. Sorry. I just called us to order. <laughs> Apologize. What I'd like to do is have a pledge of allegiance and I'm going to ask vice chair to help me with that. Thank you. If we could all stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could have a roll call, a roll call please. Oh, there it is. Commissioner Fonda Bernardi? Here. Commissioner Fresco? Here. Commissioner Lambert? Here. Commissioner Landris? Here. Uh, Commissioner Tolkien? Here. Vice Chair Vaskin? Here. And Chair Reese? Here. <clears throat> From there, we're going to move on in our agenda to um, item number four, which is the planning director's report. Cool. If we can get the director's report. Being is putting up the slide. Okay. Um, but before she gets to that, I'll just mention, of course, that you know, this is Jing's last night before she goes out on leave. Um, so um, wish her well. And um, while it's hard to imagine you know, running things and things moving on without Jing here, you'll all know how hard she works and what a great job she does. Um, we are um, happy to have Roxanne stepping into the role and covering while she's gone. Roxanne is familiar to this position. She did it last time Jing was out. So I, I know we'll be in good hands, but more than anything, just want to wish Jing well and look forward to her return. So <laughs> we absolutely agree with that sentiment. Uh, all right. So looking at what's coming up at your next meeting on March 15th, uh, so study session on public process for future of Santa Monica Airport. Um, resolution of intention for um, Clarification of permit requirements for waivers, I'm sorry, wireless facilities. Um, April 12th, uh, 1901 Wilshire Boulevard CUP for medical office in a building that was formerly the um, billiard parlor at uh, 19th and Wilshire. Uh, 1722 Ocean Park Boulevard early childhood education facility. That's an expansion of an existing uh, child care facility. Um, and also that night, ordinance uh, for clarification of permit requirements for wireless facilities. Then uh, city council actions uh, on February 22nd. Um, the council held a uh, housing element study session and gave direction to staff on key policy questions, including uh, lot consolidation, um, limits in the um, neighborhood commercial zone, and um, prepare the um, technical assistance letter to HCD regarding potential amendments to the housing element. Uh, so that was at the Planning Commission's, um, you know, based on the letter the Planning Commission submitted. And then February 28th, um, which was just uh, last night actually, um, housing element study session direction to staff to return with proposals regarding uh, processing timeline for um, housing projects. And also, um, Last night, the council adopted an IZO to eliminate restrictions on um, limited service takeout restaurants on the promenade. So this is something the commission had talked about a few years ago. And um, at the time, the council was considering the ordinance that placed a limit in terms of the number of outlets that a, a chain restaurant could have nationwide. So the limit was set at 150. Um, we had received uh, application or at least inquiry from a uh, place that's currently downtown that wanted to move to the promenade, which, you know, there's quite a few vacancies, so that, that would have been a good thing. However, th that particular outlet has 180, so they wouldn't have been able to move to the promenade. So it just raised the issue of re-examining that policy. Um, we considered, should we just up the number from 150 to something else, 500? Um, but at the end of the day, I think both staff and ultimately city council agreed that given the number of vacancies and also given the um, issues I think have come up at this commission regarding affordable outlets and, you know, should we really be limiting those types of things, um, the council um, completely got rid of that restriction. So 
at this point, um, there really is no restrictions in terms of the types of restaurants that can open on the promenade. Um, so that will go into effect after, well, the second reading will be in March, and then 38 days later will be sometime in April. And then coming up at Council on March 14th, um, private outdoor space ordinance. So this is um, making permanent the allowance to have um, outdoor dining in some of the parking lot areas and other spaces. And then, um, of course, on March 21st, the housing element adoptions so will be bringing forward the actual ordinances um, that will implement the changes that are in the housing element. Okay, questions. I saw Commissioner um, Lambert and Landris and then Fres Fresco. So Lambert. Housing element adoption means actually the, the adoption of the land use stuff. Uh, the in the yeah, yeah, sorry. We're not adopting the housing element. That. Yeah, <laughs> that's already been done. But now this is adopting the actual implementing ordinances that will implement the housing element. Um, I have a question about the, the technical assistance letter to the state. What's the status of that? And um, do you plan to involve the subcommittee of the commission in looking at it, helping you with it, adding to it, whatever the heck? Uh, I just need a status report. Um, yeah, so we're in the process of drafting that based on the letter from the commission. That was a direction from the council. Um, we did inquire, you know, do you want us to include a subcommittee? They said no. Um, you know, they said to include because the, the letter that was submitted to council was the basis. Um, you know, some of their decision making, including some of their um, their discussion during the study session and what they directed us to do was to ask really one question, um, you know, which is really if the um, city uh, if the NC zones are not upzoned, um, you know, can the um, city still retain its housing element compliance and then, you know, provide some of the reasoning as background. So that is the one question they asked um, staff to start with and then kind of, you know, report back as to how that goes. I guess my point, my issue is that we collected an awful lot of information about the neighborhoods affected and, you know, the business vacancies and mm -hmm. a lot of issues we explored and it seems like it was for nothing if we don't have some input into the letter itself. Yeah, I, that, that's that's what council directed. They, what? They, I'm sorry. That is what council directed. It was discussed. That Would you like some information from us to help you with the letter? Um, I, I think she's. I think yeah. what she's saying is that that the council directed them to draft. I understand. It and and I'm not hearing them say they already okay. have our letter. All right, that's good to know. Yeah. That's not good to know, but thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to misinterpret that, but yeah, that's I, I've okay. just right. sharing what the council directed us to do. Great. I think the next question came from Commissioner Landris. Thanks. Um, I'll just jump in on that. My understanding is that there is no formal consultation with any body of the Planning Commission. Is that right? On the on the on the letter, I'm not. I'm 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 just for clarifying. There's no formal consultation process. That the is, council directed. That is correct. The right. council. Um, said that, you know, they, they've they received the letter from the commission, you know, we can use information from there, and then we were directed to ask the one question. Right. Yeah. yeah, it strikes me that staff can seek out information from a wide variety of sources, but and will do, and I hope so. Um, my question is something else actually related to the same study session, because I've, I'm not 100% clear on where we are with respect to some of the NC zone um, protections that are pending. The my understanding was that that one way or another there were discussions about the ground floor commercial, the lot consolidation, the limit on storefront widths, and the curb cuts. I understand that the ground floor commercial. I, I saw motions that explicitly referred to ground floor commercial and lot consolidation. I've been advised by council members that they think that staff is going to bring them options on curb cuts and um, storefront widths, but I wanted to verify that. Um, so that was not in the council's motion. Um, part of the direction was to include lot con not consolidation limits in the NC zone. A policy question was asked about the requirement for, uh, or I, would, I should say continue the requirement for ground floor uh, commercial in um, Pico and Ocean Park, and that was, you know, yes, right. include that. So we are bringing back um, those two things. We did not receive um, specific direction regarding curb cuts um, or storefront widths in the midst of the study sessions. Um, obviously, uh, you know, nothing is final until things are adopted. So certainly, 
Um, you know, the, the two study sessions the council had, you know, was the opportunity to discuss that, but they could certainly have uh, further discussion, direction, changes, and what have you, um, you know, on, at their March 21st uh, public hearing. Okay, that's super helpful. Thank you. I have one more question. Wait, wait Commissioner, oh, Commissioner Fresco was. Um, is the letter going to council, or is it just going directly to you from HCD? It is. Uh, my understanding is that it is coming probably from staff, right? Yeah. I think yeah. So there's there's no link with the city council. No, they again they directed us to ask one. We we the question that was being asked was shown on the screen, and they said yes, ask that question. And you know the information from the planning commission has been transmitted to the council. I'm, so. I guess my point again is just that there's been substantial information developed since that letter was written, and I don't know why you would exclude that. Uh, yeah. So a couple of things. This isn't on your agenda, so I do want to be mindful right, of that okay. that we don't get into a discussion. I think the other piece is it might be possible for staff to um, incorporate additional information. That is not, that was not what council directed. Council directed to. Council directed staff to just ask the question. Um, the only reason why I'm I'm jumping in on this piece is that we would want to be mindful of not getting too much information from too many commissioners in um, order to make sure we don't run afoul of the Brown Act. Commissioner Fresco. On that note, just to beat a dead horse, but there uh, is new information that uh, Leslie and I each developed subsequent to the Planning Commission that is public record uh, that we submitted to City Council. So it's there for you. Um, my other question also had to do with the housing element implementation. Uh, I did tune in sporadically last night, and I was just wondering if there were any big changes or things we should know about made to the red lines or suggested for that. No. the. Uh the three, it was primarily Councilmember Brzezwick, actually, um, who... I'm sorry, um, say that again? Oh, it was primarily Councilmember Brzezwick, um, who was, you know, it was kind of like a carryover from the February 22nd meeting, and the first topic that was raised with res was with respect to uh, streamlined approvals, and you can see there that was from last night, um, there was a majority direction to return with a proposal regarding processing timelines, so there was a discussion around that. Um, the second topic um, was around the design review process. Um, there was no additional, direct, there was discussion, but no additional direction that would change any of the red lines. And then the third uh, topic had to do with um, the special program around incentivizing housing on um, residentially zoned surface parking lots. Um, and that motion failed, um, so there was no additional direction that would change um, the red lines. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Great. Uh, Commissioner Landers. Just um, <clears throat> because this is our first time back in person after three years and we've had discussions about the nature of um, remote public comment, uh, which I know is not possible, I just want to ask, because I believe the, the Planning Commission is already on record on the matter, and we don't need to do any more, but I want to ask if that's the case, um, to what extent the planning staff is working with um, the city manager's office and the members of council who've been pushing to add remote public comment back to our capacity. I know it's a question of budget. I know it's a question of budget priorities, but um, I didn't want to let this meeting go by without um, calling attention to its absence because it's something we're all concerned about and asking um, whether you need anything more from us to make the case to um, in the budget process or in other dis to other decision makers about getting this back. I, I think we're pretty clear on the Commission's position on that. Um, as you mentioned, it, it really is a budget issue and um, yeah, I mean it's something that you know, the manager's office is very well aware of that people are concerned about it, but um, it's you know, looking at the priorities in terms of what we need to spend money on. Thanks. Any questions on this side of the house? Okay. I, I don't think we have any more questions, so we thank you very much for your for your report. And we're going to move on in our agenda here. <clears throat> and I'm going to do a quick announcement regarding public comment. Um, 
dovetailing with what we just talked about, is public comment tonight is a real oral, oral comment. And to get a chance to speak, you have to fill out a speaker's chit and put it up here with um, the commission secretary. So we hope everybody has done that. One last thing, just because I, I heard it already, let's try to turn off our phones so that we don't have any distractions from that. Um, and I would also just announce that I'm great to see everybody, and I'm happy that we're back in a in a in person setting. So with that, I'd ask you: Do we have any commissioner announcements? Not seeing any commissioner announcements. I'm going to open um, public comment on non-agendized items. So any item that is not on tonight's agenda, this would be the appropriate time to get up and speak about it. And we'll let this last chit come in and talk to staff. I'm also going to apologize in, the, in, in advance that I will likely butcher people's names, and I'm not doing that on purpose. Anything for non-agendized items? OK. OK, so we do not have any public input on non-agendized items, so we're going to move on to agenda item number seven, which is consent calendar. We have nothing. Agenda item number eight, study session. We do not have anything to, we're studying tonight. There's no continued items under item nine. No administrative items under item 10, so we come to public hearings. And the first hearing is hearing 11A, which is for, at is for a site located at 1415 Ocean Avenue, case number 22ENT-0298. This is an amendment to an alcohol CUP 2000 or 13 CUP-017 for the Georgian Hotel, consideration of an exemption under the California Environmental Quality Act. If we could get a staff report, we'd appreciate it. Chair? Yes. Would you be open to a motion to waive the staff report? If that is supported by my fellow. I'll make that motion. Second. We have a first and a, a second. For clarification, that would mean just going straight to questions of staff. It wouldn't okay. cut that off. OK. Uh, this is the point of order. I think we'll do ex parte at some point. Oh, right. OK. Thank you very much. Um, let's start with that first before we yeah. go on to anything else. So if we get started, the far end of the dais. Uh, I had a brief conversation with Ken Kozel about this yesterday. Kevin, sorry, mixing you all up. <laughs> it's up to you, Leslie. Oh, um, I've been, I have gotten several emails from Mr. Kozel and requesting a meeting and I responded with, I didn't really think I needed a meeting. I understood the project. Great. Um, I had um, several conversations with Mr. Kozel going back to February 8th. I also had a brief conversation with um, Danielle Wilson of Unite Here um, and a uh, meeting with Mr. Kozel and his team um, a couple of days ago. It's I thought I had it in my notes um, regarding the evolution of the restaurant on site. Uh, and that's... Um, um, Commissioner Tolkien? Okay. Yeah, I had a Zoom meeting on Monday with uh, Mr. Kozel and uh, the hotel owner and a brief conversation earlier today with Danielle Wilson of Unite Here Local 11. Okay. And for myself, I had a meeting at the site on Monday with Mr. Kozel and the applicants <coughs> um, where they walked me through the proposal. I will also mention that I was on the commission back in, I want to say 2008 or something when it was, it was before us so at some point before. So I remember those um, conversations quite, quite well, or I remember those conversations. And then I did get contacted by Danielle Wilson, but she told me she had no comments on this project. So those are my ex partes. And I think we can now move to the uh, motion at hand. And thank you for keeping me in track. To waive the staff report? We're still waiving. That's to waive the staff report. Okay, yeah. But allow questions of staff. Okay, um, and, and I did just want to note that um, the there's a supplemental report posted online with a revised STOA in case you, you are not aware. So that has been posted. Um, Commissioner Fadabonardi? Yes. Commissioner Fresco? 
Yes. Commissioner Lambert? Yes. Commissioner Landris? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Tolkien? Yes. Vice Chair Askin? No. And Chair Reese? Yes. Okay, with that, um, if we have questions, this would be the appropriate time, and I see the first hand right here. Sure, and I would just like to ask for um, a, a discussion of the supplemental staff report in case colleagues have not had a chance to review that. My name is David Ang. I'm an associate planner and case planner for this project. Um, the supplemental report had to do with the uh, parking variance that was approved um, for the site um, back in 2015. And since the adoption of the downtown community plan, which no longer requires um, parking um, for, the, for the site, the, the, the parking variance is no longer necessary. And for that reason, uh, the findings and the conditions um, are no longer needed, and so that was struck from the draft uh, STOA, and that was basically the um, the gist of the the corrections in that staff report. Great. Any other questions of staff at this point? Go ahead, sir. Just to follow up on that, and it, I'm going to direct this to the city attorney. Um, the uh, the removal of that section of the st of the uh, STOA. Um, actually relieves the applicant of a fair number of obligations relative to transportation demand management, local hiring, and a number of other things. Um, are we obligated to remove those? I mean, is this something that these are no longer enforceable provisions, or is this discretionary? Uh, is this discretionary before the commission? So the planning manager can jump in here, um, but essentially, the it was a discrete entitlement that they were that they have since abandoned, and they have elected to fall under the current DCP rules for parking. So it was at their election to do so. It was okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioner Baskin? Yeah. So I asked this question of the uh, project uh, applicant when I met with them earlier this week, but. Are, are you aware of any time at which uh, the door at issue was open as a public access for ingress and egress during the time in which the residential building next door uh, essentially had been built? Um, I'm not aware of the, the that particular door being open when the residential building was was built. I I know it was open. Pre, you know, definitely prior, we have some records of, of the building permits when the hotel, you know, operated uh, many decades ago. Got it. Okay. I do not see, I see no other questions. Well, thank you right, right now. We'll ask the applicant to come up and give their presentation. Mr. Kozel, I, I believe the screen will show you in front, but you get 15 minutes for your presentation. Right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Kevin Kozel, 1256 Street. Um, I'm appearing tonight on behalf of the applicant, the Georgian Hotel owner. First of all, I want to start by saying how nice it is to be back in person and, and see everyone in person, so that's uh, very nice. Um, we appreciate staff's work on this, and we're in full agreement with the staff recommendation. Uh, as Mr. Ring indicated, uh, the revised STOA tonight, uh, those at, there was a parking variance and a CUP. They were completely distinct. Um, we have a zoning conformance letter from a couple of years ago where that con staff confirmed the parking variance is no longer applicable, so we abandoned that. So that's completely gone and, and, and is no longer relevant. None of the conditions apply. Um, I want to just briefly state the context for this and then turn it over to John Blanchard um, from the hotel who will provide more context. As staff explained, the Georgian Hotel has an existing alcohol CUP in the staff report explained, um, allows alcohol and food service to the general public and hotel guests. The um, only condition we're seeking to amend is condition 13, which originally was adopted to um, allow that south facing door to be an emergency exit only. That was imposed back in 2015. At that time, the city had concerns about noise, and we think we were able to address those, and John will, will point this out in two ways. Uh, number one, this will be a reservation only, so there will be no queuing of lines, people waiting outside, that will not happen. 
Um, and second, there's a two-door vestibule that will prohibit any noise from um, escaping from the restaurant. And then also, it's just a different world now. After COVID, there's much more activity on the street. Um, outdoor dining is now allowed. And so we honestly don't think that um, having this door be allowed as an entrance is going to add any noise. Um, and also, I want to indicate that we have several members of the project team here tonight. So if you have any specific questions, about how this will operate, the impacts. We have people here that can help answer those. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to, to Mr. Blanchard to kind of explain in more detail. Hello. Uh, thank you all for uh, hearing us today. It's an honor to be back uh, on the first day you guys are back. So this is fun. Um, so uh, I'm John Blanchard. Uh, I'm the owner of the Georgian Hotel. Uh, this has been a uh, passion project for me when I started my company 13 years ago. Uh, this is a building that I have been wanting to own for 13 years. And we were very, very fortunate to acquire it uh, two and a half years ago. Um, as some of you may know, this building has a tremendous amount of rich history in Santa Monica. Um, it was developed and owned by Roseman Board. Um, it was nicknamed the First Lady back in its time as one of the tallest buildings in Santa Monica. It was also uh, a place from the 30s to the 60s where it was a major destination for all parts of uh, the West Coast. And over the years, it has changed hands and become different things. Um, and for us, we really wanted to bring it back to her uh, a special place of you know the 30s and 50s. Um, the original restaurant um, in the hotel uh, that we're talking about today was called the Georgian Room. Uh, we're going to be bringing that name back into uh, that restaurant. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is the uh, original entrance uh, to, to the restaurant, which, as Kevin said, was um, taken away in, uh, in 2015. Um, we just completed um, a uh, TI renovation, and the um, hotel is... Uh, been open and running now for uh, a few weeks, and uh, we're excited to uh, hopefully get this uh, uh, entrance door approved. Um, so we'll uh, go through a couple slides here. So this is the uh, floor plan. Um, we're going to focus on the area that is in, in white. Um, so at the top of your screen is a uh, entry point. Uh, that comes from the uh, uh, public sidewalk. You go down some steps, and then you'll see here that uh, very first door, which says uh, existing uh, exterior doors to remain. Um, those doors uh, have, have been there since as far as we know. And then there's about a 15-foot uh, uh, gap between the uh, next door, which you'll see down by that first booth down there. So uh, that door we upgraded to a uh, STC 50 rating. Um, so basically what that means is, is when you're standing in that vestibule, you can't hear anything going on in that restaurant. Um, so um, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is just a uh, image of the first floor restaurant, which has been approved since 2015. So I just wanted to point that out. So uh, sorry about these photos. It was pouring rain the other day when we took them, but hopefully it gives you the idea. So. Uh, the person standing that took this photo is standing on city uh, sidewalk. You'll see the brickwork there, uh, which leads you down a few steps uh, to the door down to the left. Um, this here is a few other shots of uh, where the sidewalk uh, is and kind of where our property line ends and begins. So if you look at this picture um, on my screen, it'd be the top left where it says Ocean P. So that appears to be on the property line of our neighboring building, uh, as well as our property line. Um, just beyond that is the, uh, is the city sidewalk, which you can kind of see in that picture to the right, as well as the bottom left. The bottom left is a really good idea of showing where our neighbor's building ends um, and where that driveway uh, kind of begins. It goes down. Uh, this is kind of taking a step down the stairs. So you'll see, uh, go back one, please. Thank you. Um, so what we uh, wanted to uh, propose is that we would put a um, uh, call box uh, where that red arrow is. 
And um, as Kevin had mentioned, this room is going to be reservation only. Um, this is our secondary entrance. We do have a primary entrance to this restaurant inside the building. And uh, in a perfect world, that entrance inside would mainly be used for our hotel guests that are staying with us. And non-hotel guests would use this entrance. So we do have two entrance, uh, two primary, uh, excuse me, two main entrances into this facility, one through the hotel and one uh, that we're asking for uh, today. So the idea is that someone would press this call box, the host inside on the other side of that door would uh, reach back out and say, um, uh, you know, welcome to the Georgian room, do you have a reservation? We would ask for the person's name. If they do have a reservation, this door would open and they would walk into this uh, area here. The host would wait for the door to close, then they would walk down the stairs and open that door to uh, the right, which says the new STC 50 uh, door. Um, then that door would open and guests would uh, walk through that door. Um, if the table is not ready, we do have a couch and lounge in this area. Uh, we also have uh, seating upstairs while they wait for a seat. Because we're reservation only, we don't expect a lot of waiting. Um, really the point is, can we go back one? Really the point is, is that people will not be queuing up outside. If they don't have a reservation, they will be asked to email us and come back or visit us uh, at, our, at our restaurant upstairs. Um, as far as exiting, um, currently it's our understanding that the door is used for uh, emergency exit only. And we will intend to keep it that way. Uh, we will have any of our... Um, guests exit out of the main primary, which is on the inside of the building. So if you'll see here on the screen on the left, this would be if you're leaving. So you'd go kind of around that gentleman that's in the picture there, go over to the picture to the right, up these steps. There's an elevator there and a staircase, if you can go to the next slide, that takes you up to the main level. So um, operationally, our host um, will make sure that nobody leaves that door that they're have to, going to have to go back up to the interior of the building and exit here, as you can see. So this, this image here is where all hotel guests and um, dining guests, whether it be at the main floor or the basement floor, this is our really one of our primary and only exits. Um, we didn't want folks to be walking out of the, uh, out of the other door, perhaps for additional noise. Um, I do want to point out one more thing, if we can go back to the first floor uh, slide, please. Floor plan, please, yes. So um, as you can see uh, in this kind of, on the far right of your screen, it kind of has some gray lines through it. So that is the existing um, terrace that has been there since 1933. And that has been a dining room for quite some time. Um, this does have an open experience to it. Um, so this already had noise, and as Kevin had shared, um, not only us, but our neighbors at uh, the um, seafood restaurant, Sushi Roku, uh, and the restaurants all up and down uh, did adopt all of the sidewalk dining from the COVID ordinance. So, you know, sound has, uh, in, in, you know, kind of increased since then, and we believe that by managing this with uh, great security and a great uh, operating program, that um, we're not going to uh, increase the uh, the uh, noise uh, in by using this door as an entrance only. Um, I think that was it. Uh, just one other quick point. I wanted to uh, respond to uh, Commissioner uh, Raskin's question about the adjacent building. We do have building permits from the 60s that show that door being an existing entry. And I do believe that building next door is under rent control, which means it would have been built in the early 1970s. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that that, that door was in use when the residential building was there. So. And with that, if, um, again, we're open for questions, and we have a number of experts here if you have anything specific. Right. Uh, since we're going to have a question or two for you, and I saw the Do first. Can you stay up here? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first question with Commissioner Landers, please. Thank you. I have um, two main questions. Um, to, and to what extent does any of, do any of these renovations trigger um, ADA issues for access, and how are you communicating to people who can't navigate stairs that yeah. they can get into this restaurant? Yeah, so we have not made um, 
any uh, any improvements that would affect ADA during our TI renovation. So uh, with or without the entrance uh, being granted, uh, we've always, the building has always had, since prior to us owning it in the two and a half years we have owned it, ADA access to all areas of the building. So currently, um, there's an ADA lift on the exterior, which brings you to the main floor. Then there is another lift, which brings you up to one more floor. And then uh, there is an elevator right there that would take you down to the basement restaurant, the Georgian Room. So, of course, a hotel guest or non-hotel guest would always have access uh, through that. And are you anticipating some form of signage somewhere to tell people who don't know that in advance so they don't come up to the stairs and go, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have um, valet out front as well as bell as well as security. Um, so anytime somebody is arriving, whether by car or, or, or walking or other, they're greeted first before they even enter anywhere of the property. Right. And so we will always ask, you know, are you dining with us tonight? Are you staying with us tonight? Essentially, where are you headed? And we will always guide those that uh, may need assistance. Okay, thank you. And then we had discussed the, and I can see that the fence is already moved from those, the initial um, photographs that were shared with us. We had discussed in our call the issue of the risk of people kind of transiting that driveway. Um, what? Do you anticipate, yeah, if you can bring that back up. I see where the, I see where the property line is. Um, would you be open to, or are you already planning to kind of extending the barrier a little bit more like what it was in the photos we saw so that it really isn't possible for someone to dart across that private driveway? Yeah, so do you mind if I step up one step so I can point at something real quick? Yeah, okay. because if it's okay, is it, so it's up we have to hear him though. So oh, we have to. Go ahead and point it out, but you're going to have to go back and this, tell him. This white fencing was temporary. That was just COVID fencing. I want to focus on that picture on the top left. Where that blue planter ends has been there as far as we know. That curb, that gray curb is um, on our neighbor's property, and that, that white sign is on our neighbor's property. So... <clears throat> it's our, our understanding that that public driveway starts right where that white sign is. Mm -hmm. And to the right of that white sign is um, Santa Monica's uh, 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 sidewalk. So I am more than happy to put something in between that blue planter exactly. and that white uh, 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 sign. Not a problem at all. Um, if you guys grant it to us, I would love to put a planter there. I would love to do something there. I would love to hide that sign. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to do it, but if you grant it, I would be very happy to do that. Okay. We can bring that. Can we bring that back up in discussion later? Just one, one other quick point. This is a historic building, and so um, we can't really do anything to the outside without city permission. We just don't want to be caught in a catch-22 where you impose a condition that says you have to put something here, and then we're told by building building and safety or planning staff or landmarks that you can't do that. That's that's our only concern. Right. That's what I want to. Yeah. Do, could we come back to that later, or do you want to uh, during discuss during our discussion? We can. I can about. quickly answer that now. If if something is subject to the landmarks commission's jurisdiction, the planning commission could explore a condition that said subject to landmarks commission review and approval. And would that include a, something as as simple as a planter? If it's a modification to the landmark parcel, yes. If it's not a modification to the landmark parcel, probably not. So a planter that sits on top might not be a modification. We, it, it would depend on what was what was being proposed. Okay. Yeah, and I just I did want to point out one other thing, um, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, the public sidewalk uh, for us is actually here, so it is it is more recessed than the uh, white neighboring building is. So people just use that in general. If, if we were pre-COVID dining, people would hang a right right around that and have another four or five feet, you know, walking through there as, as just a public right away. So are you suggesting that the, that, that spot, that space in front of the blue um, 
planter because it's a it's a permanent planter um that that is also city property or is that your no, property no i'm just what i what i'm trying and, and we don't have the right photo for it um this is a little bit better but uh all that all that uh fencing and blue uh planters was for covid dining right um what i'm saying is that when all that was stripped away our, our our property line is where you see that glass up there where you see that uh black and white awning so people are always able to kind of swing a right around that and just kind of walk through there anyway, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. I mean, technically, if they do cut through that sign in my blue planter, they're walking on our neighbor's private property. Got it. Yeah. Last question, just to clarify, you said that after people eat, they're gonna exit the other exit. Correct, they will exit out of the main front of the build, the main entry of the building, correct. Thanks, okay. Commissioner Tolkien? Yeah. You get to what speak into your speak, speak into your mic. Some planter pots there. Would that kick in some something mobile? Yeah. I think again we'd have to look at what was being proposed. It could be interpreted as still being an alteration to the landmark parcel. Something quick to do and okay. hope to find it. Yeah, happy to put whatever we can in there. I, I wouldn't mind it myself if we could do it, but. Okay, other questions? Commissioner Raskin, Vice Chair Raskin. Thanks, uh, and apologies for the hyper-technical question, but do you know how loud the intercom's gonna be? Um, we don't, I'm happy to uh, bring Ian up, who's our uh, acoustic engineer. Um, we can have volume set on that. I know it can be adjustable. We do intend it to be much more intimate and soft. Hi, uh, my name is Ian Bromelow from Newsom Brown Acoustics. I'm a senior technical director there. So we did look at um, noise calculations, um, both from people um, entering the building and the intercom. Basically, the intercom's not gonna be any louder than somebody having a conversation. Somebody has a conversation at about 60 dB. By the time that, um, uh, through distance and also through attenuation by the brick wall that you see surrounding the entrance, by the time that noise level gets to the uh, uh, rental building, um, noise levels are about 40 dB, which are much lower than what the existing noise climate is, even late at night. Thank you. And just uh, one more question, sorry, but I, I realize people don't usually make reservations at uh, midnight, but do you anticipate that you'll be getting people going through the door at all hours at which the restaurants open? Um, we, we will maintain a reservation only even kind of later into the evening. Um, we will plan on, you know, perhaps a slower night that we, we, may, we may just run everything through the inside. Um, you know, we, we do understand that people will still, still try to get in. You know, we do have folks at every restaurant that no is not, you know, an answer, right? And we believe that those people will be directed from security to go inside and they would meet with one of our uh, hostesses on the inside, which is on the main hotel floor, not over here. And what we would do with them is, uh, you know, perhaps take them in, but more likely give them our email give them our phone number and say, please, you know, come back and call us or dine in our restaurant up here, sit at our bar up here. Um, we do have security 24 seven um, surrounding the perimeter. So uh, for other reasons other than just this operation and um, we will make sure we do a good job at guiding them. So to, to that end, would you be amenable to a condition that limited the uh, hours of operation for the door? I mean, preferably not. Got it, okay. Other questions? Well, I guess it's my turn. Um, so the, I think I expressed to you guys, my concern was that box out there, the speaker. And now I'm hearing tonight that it's still part of the plan, but now you're gonna be really quiet with it. We did have that conversation and after speaking with uh, Kevin and the team, um, it is our request to do that. We did take into consideration your concept um, if you reject, you know, the call box, I, we do believe that your concept would be acceptable that we discussed, which would be more of a push button and instead of a voice coming out of the box. 
Okay. And just for the, the for everyone's edification, my concern was that noise, because I remember having this long conversation about noise, whatever, how many years ago we had this on this case before us. And what I suggested to them was, well, if they have reservation, can't you do a keypad and they have a keypad that they can get entrance? Yeah. Or something to that effect. So that's what I was. Or, excuse me, sorry. Or a, or a button or something. Well, something to that effect. So yeah, and if you, something if for you, us to think about while we're listening to public comment. Yeah, right. We're, yeah. we're open to that condition if you impose it. We, we can yeah, absolutely. Something else on the door, uh, like an old speakeasy. Right. Which, yeah, a keypad on the exterior where there would be no noise, a buzz er that would only be heard by the hostess on the interior. We will have a camera out there at all times. Um, so if you guys impose it, absolutely, we would uh, abide. Commissioner Lambers. Um, couldn't you just tell us all the secret password right now? One, two, three, four. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, barring that, what about, I mean, just just want to make sure you're amenable. It, what about a some some sort of a condition that limits the decibel level of the speaker? Um, I mean, these things can be designed and the volume can be capped, and we do have a noise ordinance that guide, you know, with guidelines, so we could go 10 decibels below that or something just to give you, give you <laughs> It's not as loud I'm, as Jack I'm and also, Fox, right? I'm also, I do want to say I'm a little concerned about this airlock, and I hope you don't have anyone named Hal or Dave um, <laughs> running the door. <laughs> uh, but yes, airlock. absolutely, we consider that. Okay, um, thank you very much. Appreciate thank the you. presentation. Uh, you'll get an opportunity to come back up and list and respond to any comments that we get during public comment. And with that, we're going to turn to public comment. Thank you for your time. Yep. <clears throat> and I think my our first speaker. We have two speakers on this tonight, and it's uh, Justin Wass and then Carol Emley. So Justin can come up. Hello, commissioners, and that's Justin Weiss. Uh, oh, oh, no. <laughs> I, I, I've gotten much worse, believe me. Uh, so I'm here in support of uh, granting the secondary uh, entry point to the Georgian Hotel. Um, my job, in essence, is to build a better Los Angeles. Uh, I'm with Kennedy Wilson and a retail broker, so we do a lot of work in Santa Monica, throughout the entire city. And it's really just street by street, putting in businesses, uh, bringing in restaurants, bringing in retail, bringing in bars, because you know, it's the best way to build block by block. You know, We're heavily invested in and uh, work in Santa Monica, really trying to help revitalize the promenade. Uh, I'm in support of this because you know it's critical to be able to bring in responsibly run uh, establishments like the Georgian, that, and we put them in the best position possible commissioners to succeed. We've done numerous basement bar speakeasy deals throughout all of LA, and I can tell you personally that when you have the right kind of operator that's doing it responsibly and does what John is doing, which is crossing every T and dotting every I, it can be such a boon to the city. What I've learned over the last 10 years in Santa Monica is that uh, the more success we have on Ocean and Second, the more it bleeds into the promenade. And I can tell you that the Georgian, when it opens, it's going to be such a great a kind of a Carlisle, New York hotel style destination where it brings in such an eclectic group of people. And giving that ability for somebody on the street to be able to go in through a speakeasy style interest and the cachet of that, I think, can be invaluable in a lot of ways that we can't even think about uh, or that we, we don't even realize right now. And that comes, again, just from my experience working on uh, deals like this. To note, I didn't work on this deal at all. Uh, I'm just really excited about the hotel. I'm a lifelong uh, Angelino who really has a passion for urbanism, and I'm really excited about uh, about this. And so I hope that all the commissioners uh, do uh, do support it. And uh, thank you. Next speaker is Carol. Nice to see you. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, I'm Carol Limline. Most of you know me. Speaking on behalf of the Santa Monica Conservancy, uh, we want to make clear that we support the recommendation to amend the CUP as proposed, allowing the reopening of the historic entryway to the basement restaurant. The landmark Georgian Hotel is a highlight of the Conservancy's downtown walking tour. 
for its beautiful architecture and its history. Its lavish decoration speaks of the Art Deco style, defying the Depression era in which it was built. It helped to reinforce Ocean Avenue as the location of the city's uh, premier hotels. And the architect also designed several other downtown city landmarks, such as the Central Tower. The basement restaurant was a significant asset to the hotel for many years. The name changed from the Georgian room to the Red Griffin and then back again. The exterior door was used originally and continued to be uh, used until recently. The interior furnishings with their curvilinear leather banquette speak to the restaurant's historic character. There were celebrity patrons, including the, the Kennedys. The current hotel renovations are consistent with historic preservation standards and are intended to revitalize and strengthen its success. The request to reopen the original lower level entryway is part of this strategy and the applicant indicates that public access will be controlled as you have already discussed at some length tonight. Uh, Encouraging the pedestrian activity on Ocean Avenue is consistent with current city policy, which was quite different at the time when use of the entrance was denied several years ago. Um, so we are strongly in support and thank you for your consideration of this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of those, all the chits I have. Don't see any new coming in. So at this point, then it's up to the applicant, or the applicant has the opportunity to respond. Any comments they've heard? Uh, make any last statements? We'll waive rebuttal. Okay. So at that point, I'm going to close the public hearing. I'm going to turn to our commissioners for our discussion. Does anybody want to start with this discussion? I like Commissioner Fresco's shyly looking like she wants to start. Um. Are we going to turn on our mics when we want to respond like we used to, or should we raise our hand? Raise your hand works. Okay. Raise a hand works. Just wanted to know the policy. <laughs> um, but I'd recommend you turn off your mic when you're not speaking, just in case. In case I start smacking my lips. Something. All right. Um, I support this application, and I have to say that I am really not that concerned about the noise. Have you guys been on Ocean Avenue recently? I mean, I just feel like it's kind of a non-issue, and frankly, I think the planter, I mean, there's you'd have to like walk sideways to get on that driveway from the pathway to those stairs because of the parking sign, so I kind of feel like that's a bit of a non-issue too. And so I'd like to make a motion to approve this application. Second. Any discussion on this? Commissioner yeah. Raskin. Thank you, Commissioner Landers, you can do it. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to know if it would be a friendly amendment to, um, I, I don't want them to have to alter the, I don't want them to have to alter it, but I am concerned about the, the access point because I think that I'm less. I'm. I'm less worried about it. I'm less worried about it, knowing that there, it's not going to be used as an exit. That was more my concern: was that people would be coming out kind of blind and hang, you know, sort of heading south as quickly as they could on Ocean. Um, that seems to be far less likely if this is an entrance. Um, but I, I'd be inclined to require some kind of non-altering temporary barrier, such as a planter, to that's within their, you know, that, that they should just sort of block that side in a way that... It seems to me like a planter is furniture and not really in our purview, and anything more than that would force them to go to the Landmarks Commission, which I think seems really unfair. So it sounds like he wants to put a planter there anyway. Cool. So... <laughs> As long as we're, can we can we prevent ourselves from enforcing, you know, from making their lives difficult over a planter? Is there, we can't do that. Okay. All right, then I'll stick with my second and, okay. Any other, you want, Commissioner, Vice Chair? 
Yeah, I've got uh, two requests for uh, friendly amendments. Hopefully they're friendly. Uh, I, I really liked uh, Chair Reese's idea of not using an intercom. Uh, I like the idea of having some sort of keypad system, and I'm curious if you're amenable to uh, some type of technology like that. Again, I feel like it's, you know, it's their speakeasy and, you know, but, I mean, I don't want to get a negative vote on the uh, motion because of something like that, even though I think it's kind of overreaching. <laughs> as the seconder, I'll say it's not friendly as worded. I, I have concerns about, again, you know, simplicity of access. I would consider a friendly amendment something limiting the decibel level. But I want to leave the technology within their, sorry, fully within their control. All right. How about a decibel limit then? Oh, jeez. Sorry. <laughs> Look, that's why you need to turn off your mic. That's exactly why we need to turn off your mic. It's... Uh, decibels, I, I can live with decibels. I think decibels is fair. I think they're going to go with decibels anyway, uh, and it's not overreaching, and I want you to vote in favor of the... Friendly to me, too. Can I say something? I apologize. That was really unprofessional, uncalled for, and otherwise rude. Um, I am not at all concerned about the sound coming out of this intercom, given that there's a din on Ocean Avenue at any given time anyway between the traffic and the pedestrians and the noise and the restaurants. I mean, I, and this, isn't this downstairs? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just, I, I, what? The wall. The oh, yeah, I, I'm not that concerned about it, so I agree with Nina and Sean. All right, well, I got a second uh, request here. Um, there's a condition, uh, condition number three, that currently limits the hours in which uh, noise-making activities outside can happen. And I'm wondering if we can make the hours of operation of the door coextensive with those hours for outside noise-making activity. Which condition number three? Oh, those are findings, not conditions. Sorry. Hold on. Yeah, it's on page 11. You want to change the access, the use of that door to the same hours as this? Is that what you just said? For the trash? Yeah. Um, or just to make things cleaner, how about let's just say 11 p.m.? I mean, they're, on, they're not going to get a lot of reservations after 11 p.m. anyway. Right. So why do it? Well, for the rare Sorry. case when there is somebody who comes and is loud. We gave you decibels. Be happy. <laughs> okay. Maybe we should turn our mic off for that, too. Okay. Um, are you done with your, your comments? Okay. Commissioner Tolkien? Any? Okay. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm excited about this. I think it's. I think just walking down there, I got the feeling like this is going to be something cool and exciting. Um, so, so I appreciate the effort you're putting into it. I, I still have the noise concern, and I would say to my fellow commissioners, there's a difference between the din of cars driving by. It's. Om I mean, I live near a freeway, and I jokingly say that's my river because it's a very calm little sound. I mean, not calm, but it's a, a constant noise. A speaker blurts out noise very loud, and then to one of the other commissioners says, well, there's a wall there. Well, yeah, there's a wall there that's open, and it goes right up to residential windows. So I think that I think I will support the motion based on where we're heading now, and I appreciate the work that you guys are doing there. Um, the last thing I would just say for my fellow commissioner is all you need is four votes. So if you lose three of us, you're still going to get your motion. Okay. Anyways, I'm I'm done, and I think we can call for the question. Do we have? Do we? Can we just get language from staff for the decibel limit? I, I was actually about to ask <laughs> you, like, um, may, maybe another way to think about it is because um, enforcing a decibel limit um, for like an intercom, like an intermittent intercom, I think might be challenging. Um, 
you know, and so I, I'm not sure what you're thinking about in terms of a decibel limit because there's... Can you hold that thought for just a second? It turns out I believe there's an acoustic expert in the audience <laughs> who, if we open the public comment, can probably talk to us about this. Yeah. Speaking of dotting all their I's and crossing their T's. Sir. Hi. Um, Give us your name again for the... Ian Bromelow, Newsom Brown Acoustics. Um, so the intercom is only going to be as loud or only needs to be as loud as a person's voice, right? And a person's voice is about 60 to 65 dB. And it's very easy to be able to measure and prove that the output from the intercom is going to be no louder than that. Sure. That's why we have experts. Is that? Okay. All right, thank you for your, thank you. We're going to close the public comment, or public hearing. So, it's hold on, I think TV. staff is still ruminating. Okay, and that would be condition. Would would that be a, a an addition to condition thirteen? Is that what we're thinking? Let's see. Chair, may I? There's a there's a um, there's language about controlling noisy guests. Uh, I think it fits there. Okay. So I'd recommend that you put it in. Condition 13 because that's really what's before the Commission and it is directly related to use of that door uh, And it okay. could it could be fairly simple and simply say any intercom used uh, for operation of that door shall not exceed 65 DB That works We're not regulating the decibel level of guests are we? No in condition 28 in fact we are we are well wow. They've seen me out at restaurants I guess Okay Okay, let's call for the question. I think. Well, let's hold on. Do we have you have comfort that with what we're with the motion, and we can vote on this? Yeah. Or? Would you like me to read it? So it's the staff recommendation plus a modification to condition number thirteen that will state any, in addition to what you see there, any intercom system that is used shall not exceed sixty-five decibels. And that's awesome. Great. Oh, that's right. Okay, and and, and your motion should include the CEQA exemption. Yes. Oh, I'll, are we amending our motion to include the secret exemption? Yes, we yes, are. Yes, we are. Okay. Very fun. Okay, Commissioner uh, Fonda Bernardi? Yes. Commissioner Fresco? Yes. Commissioner Lambert? Yes. Commissioner Landris? Yes. Commissioner Tolkien? Yes. Vice Chair Raskin? Yes. And Chair Reese? Yes. Thank you very much for your time. Your project was approved conditionally. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Nina. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to item 11B. This is 516 Colorado, and case numbers here are 22 ENT 0070, 22 ENT 0184, and 22 ENT 0279. This is a consideration of exemption under environmental, environmental Quality Act. Again, I'm going to just remind everybody if you're not speaking, let's turn off your mics. Um, Sorry. And <laughs> we are going to start with ex parte, ex parte disclosures. And this time I'm going to start on the left. So, do you have it? That would be you, Commissioner Tolkien. Do you have any ex parte communications on this case? No. Um, I'm going to jump in because my fellow commissioner is not sitting down. I did have a Zoom presentation from the architect last Friday where they walked me through the design of the project and um, and showed me some of their graphics about adjacency to the adjacent buildings. Then I had a call yesterday for about 15 minutes at 540 with here union representatives who had concerns about items such as the procedures, the policies that were going, the, the deviations they're asking for and appropriateness of certain uses in certain areas, really design related issues. Um, little about labor issues. I'm going back to here. Thank you. Yeah, I had a uh, Zoom meeting with the uh, project architects, uh, uh, Howard Lax and Associates, uh, yesterday. And I spoke briefly with Danielle Wilson from Unite Here Local 11 earlier today. Commissioner Landers. I had um, emails with, um, let's see, I had an email exchange with, with Mr. Lax that I've actually forwarded to the um, to the public comment as well because I had uh, because it contained information that was not in the staff report. Um, 
uh, elevations that were not there. Um, and so that was our email exchange on February 24th. Um, also on February 24th, I had a very uh, brief conversation with uh, Daniel Wilson of Unite here um, regarding the Colorado Hotel site uh, and then um, a follow-up uh, text exchange with her just today very briefly. Um, calling attention to the letter that was sent. And then um, on uh, yesterday at 7.45 a.m., I had a uh, exchange with um, Tara Borowskis of uh, Community Corporation uh, about uh, solar issues, um, uh, light access and light and privacy issues, uh, and the rooftop bar. Um, I had a Zoom meeting at 11 a.m. on Monday. Uh, that I had invited Tara Baraskas to, so it was Howard and his team and Tara, and we specifically focused on the drawings and the impact of the project on the adjacent um, housing project and came up with some ideas for mitigation if they're acceptable to everybody. Um, and I, I've um, exchanged various emails with both Tara and Mr. Lax since then. I had a Zoom meeting with Howard Lax on February 27th. On February 28th, I had a phone call with Tara Baraskis, and after that, I had a phone call with Howard Lax. And uh, this afternoon, Danielle Wilson called me with uh, uh, some of the issues that are also in the letter from Local 11. I had a conversation for about 45 minutes with Howard Lax on Monday. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, we'll turn to staff for your presentation. Take it away. Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. It's nice to see you all in person after these last three years. Uh, my name is Ross Furman, Senior Planner for the City of Santa Monica. And the project before you tonight is a development review permit and a conditional use permit for a new Tier 3, 21,726 square foot, eight-story hotel development comprised of 74 guest rooms above two subterranean levels. Additionally, a minor modification has been requested to waive the Build 2 line development standard and to allow for an alternative design that still meets the intent of activating the ground floor street frontage. The project is located at 516 Colorado Avenue, uh, the former site of Angel's Attic, and is a single parcel that is 6,263 square feet in size. The project site is within the transit adjacent zoning district within the downtown community plan and is immediately surrounded by parcels uh, that are comprised of six, uh, two six-story hotels to the north, uh, the big blue bus maintenance yard to the south, and five-story multi-unit residential buildings to both the east and west. Uh, the Expo light rail runs immediately in front of the project um, along Colorado Avenue, which terminates to the west of the project site at the downtown Santa Monica station. Uh, it's important to also note uh, that the subject parcel is substandard with a 41 foot 9 inch width. Uh, so to go over some project details, uh, the project is, as I said, a tier 3 uh, project. The height is 84 feet. There will be eight stories with two subterranean levels. Uh, the total project size is 21,726 square feet. There will be 74 guest rooms. There will be no parking on site, as is permitted in the downtown community plan. However, there will be three guest drop-off drop -off spaces. There will be 24 bike parking spaces, uh, eight short-term, 16 long-term. And some of the amenities will include a fitness center, a business center, a bakery room, all within one of the sub subterranean levels, ground floor dining uh, along Colorado Avenue, and a restaurant bar, and uh, a rooftop restaurant and bar on the eighth story. Uh, the proposed project maximizes the site given the challenges that a 41 foot 9 inch parcel width presents in terms of programming, efficiency, and circulation. The ground floor is comprised of a lobby, vehicle uh, guest drop off area, and a linear circulation access driveway that is entered from Colorado Avenue and exits onto the rear alley. The ground floor also incorporates an outdoor dining area along Colorado Avenue and operational components along the alley, which includes a trash room and loading space. Starting at the second floor, uh, each upper floor, except for the eighth floor, contains 12 guest rooms, which are all connected by a central open air corridor. 
The upper floors are largely stacked with almost identical floor plans, except for at the front and rear of the building where the angular positioning of the guest rooms and balconies alternate on each floor. Uh, the eighth floor or rooftop is largely comprised of an open terrace and a restaurant slash bar area. However, two guest rooms are proposed on the south side of the building along with some operational components. The contemporary, the contemporary building design is divided into four separate building blocks that have been enhanced by angled cantilevered balconies and guest rooms that animate the building at the front and rear facades. Uh, the mass and scale are further activated by a central air, a central open air corridor and vertical breaks along the east and west facades. The vertical breaks on the east and west facades are incorporated to not only break up the massing, but to bring light and air into the guest rooms and interior of the building. While the proposed eight story, 84 foot high structure is taller than the immediately, the immediate surrounding buildings, together these design elements bring a three dimensionality to the structure, especially at the front and rear elevations that modulate the building to help break up the scale and massing of the structure. As for the building operation components, I did want to highlight two of them. Um, a loading space and trash, and trash room are provided on the ground floor along the alley as shown in this image. Um, based on the site constraints due to the substandard parcel width, the loading space is being proposed to, at specific times, also, also serve as a staging area for the trash pickup. This proposed configuration has been reviewed and approved by both the city's mobility and resource recovery and recycling divisions. Um, and two conditions that you see on your screen have been incorporated into the STOA to help with the management of the two building operation components. Um, both have to do with timing and days of operation that the loading zone would not be uh, permitted for loading, would need, need to be allowed for trash pickup. On August 15th, 2022, the Architecture Review Board conducted a preliminary review of the contemporary design of the project and expressed support for the overall design strategy, especially given the challenges that the parcel size and dimensions presented to the project. Um, however, the board did provide comments and to summarize them, uh, uh, some of them were regarding how the eastern and western facades, uh, sorry, the eastern and western forms uh, could better complement each other how design details could be better carried down to the ground floor, how more attention needed to be provided to the pedestrian entry over the vehicle drop-off area, and how the interior side brakes could be better developed to ensure privacy. Uh, in response, the applicant uh, incorporated a handful of revisions, uh, but to highlight a, hand, a couple, uh, they introduced the same angled balcony and guest room design to the eastern form. They strengthened the high, they strengthened, they strengthened the hierarchy of, to the pedestrian over the drop off area by widening the entry path, incorporating decorative paving, adding a more prominent entry door, as well as integrating signing, signage and lighting. Uh, and all, uh, and finally, um, they also included vertical green screens with incorporated planning, plantings within the interior west side vertical breaks. Pursuant to the downtown community plan, a development review permit is required for non-housing projects that are between 10,000 and 30,000 square feet. Uh, the project being proposed falls within this, uh, this range. Uh, and in order to approve a DRP, uh, findings must be made that include such things as the project and uses are consistent with the applicable standards and compatible with the surrounding site and neighborhood. Uh, the project is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies within the loose and the DCP. Uh, the, pro the project promotes the general welfare, welfare of the community and the, and the project provides community benefits. Additionally, uh, pursuant to the Santa Monica Municipal Code, a conditional use permit uh, is required for the hotel land use itself. Um, in order to approve a CUP, uh, similar findings must be made, uh, which include that the proposed use is conditionally allowed in the applicable zoning district and complies with all other applicable provisions. The project is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies within the loose and DCP. The, uh, the subject parcel is, suit is physically suitable for the type of land use. Uh, the proposed use is compatible with existing and permissible land uses within the zoning district and general area. And finally, that the physical location or placement of uses on the site is compatible with and relate harmoniously to the surrounding neighborhood. 
Uh, pursuant to the DCP, uh, the bill the build to line development standard requires that buildings with non-residential uses on the ground floor and not facing a residential district be constructed at the building frontage line for 70% of the linear street frontage. However, through the minor modification process, the DCP allows for the modification of this standard. If in addition to the normal minor modification findings, the three additional findings you see on your screen can be made. These additional findings are all related in some way to ensuring pedestrian orientation design is still achieved. Due to the substandard parcel width of 41 feet 9 inches and the challenges that that presents to the programming of the project in terms of efficiency, access, and circulation, the applicant is requested to waive the build to line development standard. However, the applicant has proposed an alternative design that still meets the design and pedestrian orient or pedestrian intent of the build to line requirement which is to activate the ground floor along the public right away. The vehicular circulation access drive has been minimized to the extent possible, and the area not used for this access drive has been designed to provide a defined pedestrian entrance and, incorporated, and has incorporated an outdoor dining area. Uh, therefore, staff believes waiving the build to line requirement and approving the alternative design does not adversely affect the pedestrian experience along Colorado Avenue. As required, public notices were mailed to property owners and tenants within 750 feet, as within a 750 foot radius, and the notice was published in the Santa Monica Daily Press. Up until 5 p.m. today, I was aware that three public comments uh, had been submitted. To kind of summarize, the comments all provided concerns regarding the compatibility of the proposed uses, the impacts the development might have on the surrounding parcels, the general process, and some lack of detail regarding employee amenities. Um, and with that, that concludes my presentation and staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the development review permit, conditional use permit, minor modification, the statement of official action, and adopt the findings determining the proposed project exempt from CEQA. And I'm here to answer any of your questions. Great. Turns out we have some. So I'm going to start with Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. That was great, Ross. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of brief questions. One is, um, just for clarification of the public, is there anything involving alcohol service before us tonight? There is not. Uh, there is a proposed restaurant and bar, both on the ground floor and upper floor, but as there is no restaurant operator yet, uh, the alcohol exemption request would come at a later date. That's what I mean. The, the CUP for alcohol is not before us tonight. It will come in the future. It is not. It it's most likely will be an alcohol exemption, not a CUP, so it would not be coming before you at that point either. Okay. Um, the other question is, we have no parking requirement now downtown, correct? Correct. Uh, and I know the applicant is going to use valet parking. Is that a voluntary thing? Can we require valet parking? I think you can probably potentially condition that as this is a development review permit and a conditional use permit. Um, I'm sure the applicant kind of explain more in detail what their parking strategy is, uh, but the DCP doesn't technically require any. Because uh, my question goes to the um, point in the Unite Here letter that is asked for valet parking for employees, which is a good idea, but I don't know if we have the authority to do that. I mean, in terms of... Um... Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, something related to the hotel operations, um, if it's within the scope of the conditional use permit, um, it could be, but, um, you know, something that relates to parking for like a specific group or what have you, I think we probably have to look at that. Like valley parking on its own, right. you know, certainly could be tied to project operations. But in terms of like the internal um, hotel operations or layout, you know, that's sort of not normally that level of detail, you know, at, I understand, but unless the applicant volunteers to do that. Sure. Yeah. And to add to that, uh, as this is a Tier 3 project, there will be enhanced TDM requirements that might cover right. some of the right. uh, employee needs for parking. And, and, and the valet parking for employees is not in our their TDM plan, correct? It's not. But it could conceivably be added to it, if the, particularly if the applicant agrees to it. Yes. C correct, yeah. The, the, they're required to submit a preliminary TDM program to the Mobility Division. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as part of this review, and then the sort of final TDM program is worked out as part of the plan check process. I understand. Um, there was also um, a suggestion that the that the cars not go through the site, but actually drop off and pick up in the alley. Is that remotely possible? We reviewed different configurations with mobility, and it seems like this configuration is the 
only viable option given also the width of the lot. Right. If they were to do the alley, the alley is actually a dead end alley, so you can't just drive through the alley either. It, the configuration of how to maneuver the vehicles on the lot was quite complicated given the 40 foot wide. I understand. Width. But and then a, a question I asked Heidi before the meeting was, do we have any authority to um, do programmatic decision making within the building itself, like what goes where? So it's difficult to say with certainty. Any condition that you place would need to have a nexus to the findings right. that you are being asked before you. So generally, because it generally would not occur related to the development review permit, but conceivably there could be some programmatic um, conditions that you place related to the CUP. Um, but um, but we would need to discuss in, de in more detail, you know, with respect to this specific. But they would have to be directly related to the findings of the CUP and the DRP. Yes. It couldn't just be something that we, we would like to see happen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, La Commissioner Landers. Thanks. Um, so I, I have some questions about the what our discretion is. So I'm, I'm going to start by asking um, what about the definitions of compatibility. We, we when we were looking at housing, we shied away from the word compatibility because of its implications um, for for housing. But this is not a housing project. So. Um, when we look at terms like compatibility, harmoniousness, and the general welfare, what is our range of discretion? Um, it's quite broad, uh, you know, given that, again, this is not a housing project. So, you know, um, in terms of the commission's purview of compatibility, you know, again, it, it could certainly be quite expensive, um, you know, and as long as it's, again, it's tied to the findings that are necessary um, for the permits that are before you. Okay. And what um, we, we've heard, I heard this concern as I reported, um, what solar rights do the neighboring residents have? So the city does not have a solar rights or solar access um, ordinance, um, you know, so again, um, any conditions, you know, that would address the mass and scale of the building, you know, have to relate to the findings um, that are required in this case, you know, more likely to the development review permit. Um, but something tied directly to solar access, you know, that is not um, a municipal code uh, requirement. And there's nothing in state law that, no. that, that reserves them any, no, it does not that guarantee. protects them anyway. Right. Okay. Um, and then my, my last question as someone who frequently, um, bikes eastbound on Colorado, um, my recollection is that there right now is not a curb cut uh, between 5th and 6th. Uh, the next curb cut is actually the, um, is the uh, entrance to the, to the big blue bus yards at the intersection, which is a controlled intersection with a light. Um, can you just expand more on mobility's review of this proposal um, relative to our interest in multimodal transportation? Mobility, the bulk of mobility's review was in regards to the loading space and the kind of the trash configuration, but we did look at, you know, could someone feasibly access through the alley and somehow turn around on within that site? Uh, it seemed like it was quite challenging and able to do that. and. Also to be able to fit all the other components on the parcel, including the transformer, the trash room, and to be able to still kind of be able to turn around, if you will. So it was kind of decided that this would be most likely the best kind of configuration to kind of enter off of the one way of Colorado and enter out the alley. Um, and I believe the applicant does have a transportation, uh, uh, their transportation uh, manager in the audience. If, you know, you would like to ask a little bit more specific questions on some of the configuration. And did did staff, mobility staff, um, explore the inter essentially the 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 risk of adding the curb cut for the access point relative to eastbound bike traffic and pedestrian traffic, for that matter? Given that mobility reviewed the project and didn't provide any comments, I would guess that they did review that and they did not have any issues with that or they did not relay any issues to us when they reviewed it. Okay. Um, I think those are all my questions for now. Thank you.
Questions? Questions? Uh, Commissioner Tolkien. My concern was the same as uh, Commissioner Landris in terms of the solar access. Does the applicant have any t need to do any studies for that, especially to the northeast? The building on the northeast. Given that we do, the city does not have a solar access ordinance. Um, there is no requirement uh, for the applicant to conduct a, a study of that. Okay, I'm. I'm also concerned about the fact that we're closing off those people in that <clears throat> apartment building. Sam, and we're please looking come at up. A blank please wall. come up to the mic, Sam. And if there was something that I'm sorry, <laughs> the public can't hear you outside. I was also concerned about the apartment, that same apartment, that those people will now be looking at a blank wall on that side, pretty much. If there was something that could be done about that, maybe even just planting that wall. You know, I, know, I do think the applicant has made efforts to kind of review where windows are kind of lining up, and I think the applicant can maybe uh, give you more detail than I can uh, when, it's, uh, when they're up here. Vice Chair. Thank you. Uh, please forgive the Socratic question, but are there portions of the subterranean levels that count as habitable space? No, they will not count as FAR. Okay. They might be ha they might be considered potentially habitable, but they are not being factored into floor area ratio. And and why is that? They're subterranean, and they're not being used for actual living space. Got it. Okay. Questions. Question. Sean, Sean just distracted me. Okay, I have questions, so I can answer while you're. Go ahead. I'll, you're, I'll come to me. Um, I want to ask a couple questions about conditions. One and two, conditions one and two. One had hours starting at like seven in the morning for loading or something, and I'm just curious, is that just standard? Because that seems a little bit. The, it was condition one. Yeah. The, loading access seven a.m. to two p.m. and seven a.m. seems early when you're right next to residential, but is that a downtown standard or something? Those are special standards for this project that were provided to staff in concert with our mobility and our, our team, that this is the kind of standard trash pickup time window uh, that they didn't want uh, someone be in the loading space that would um, conflict with trash pickup. So that is the standard um, operating hours of our uh, trash pickup at the moment. So that's where those times and standards specifically came from. So nothing in the code? Nothing in the code. Okay. But it was somebody it was it was basically resource management saying this is our best it, practice of when we it, go out there. It was how we could find a way to kind of dual purpose the loading zone by getting a loading zone but still allowing for trash pickup, given that as you can see, there's not a lot of wiggle room on the site. So it was the compromise that mobility and RR kind of came to. Okay, and then that dives that goes dives into condition two for me, and I, I guess I'm just having a little trouble understanding what was from seven to two. We can only do loading, and we can't use there's can there shall be no storage of trash bins or materials outside of those hours. Loading zone may only be used for loading. Am I reading? It is. It does read a little confusing. Um, I think the intent is very much that it could be used as loading, but there cannot be kind of trash bins just sitting there between those hours. But there would need to be access to the trash storage area uh, when the pickup occurred. Uh, but we could look at maybe fine tuning that language if it's a little right. Because the way I read it is, you can only do loading in there at I any see, time. Yeah. So I'm just questioning why we would limit why we have those hours in there. So. If you yeah, could the intent look was, at, yeah. Look at that and see if you could clean that. I up. will confirm that with the mobility and RR division. Okay, then the next one I have for you is I see a couple of points in the in the in the staff report and the store when we talk about findings about enhanced pedestrian access. Do you have a graphic that shows me the pedestrian entrance? I think the best maybe images I have on my pre, my presentation is would be these. Um, I think it was in comparison to prior plans, the pedestrian walk and entry was much smaller. Um, there has been just kind of design features such as decorative paving, lighting, landscaping that have kind of started trying to divert attention away from the drive aisle and to the 
outdoor dining and the kind of entryway for the pedestrian. So to kind of give hierarchy to the other two thirds of the project and uh, divert attention away from the, the, the driveway. Okay, um, maybe the, the architect will have some more yeah. um, zoomed in architecture of that or renderings. And then the last, related to that, to the left of that is an outdoor seating, kind of a dining area. Is it a requirement that's dining or is that just seating? Because I look at that and I think it's seating because I don't see any kitchen. I don't know how they're going to staff. The kitchen's in one of the subterranean levels. Um, it's not a requirement that has to be dining, uh, but one of the DCP findings to kind of allow for deviation from the build two line is incorporating outdoor courtyards, plazas, and one of those is outdoor eating. Um, so it's not a requirement, but that's kind of how the applicant chose to show that activation of the ground floor street frontage was still being accomplished. So then. So then if that deviation is approved, then making sure that it operates as out, outdoor dining is actually a fairly critical. <laughs> yes, it is definitely a component of how we felt like we can meet the findings. <sighs> okay, I'm going to stop with my questions. Thank you, and Commissioner Lambert. You came to back to me. Um, even though there's no federal, state, or local law guaranteeing solar access, despite the fact there are tons of programs incentivizing solar panels, um, if, if the neighboring property, the CCSM property, intends to, to put solar panels on their roof, which they say they're going to do because their sidewall panels aren't functional anymore, um, and if this created a, a shadow onto their roof, which would impact their solar panels, wouldn't it be a compatibility issue? So we can discuss this more during discussion, but I think it would be highly unusual for the commission to make such a condition when you have not done so for, I, I'm not aware of that being a condition for solar access that you have done in another DRP. I can be corrected, but I think that's the, that's the reason why it would normally be handled through an ordinance of general applicability rather than a case by case basis, right? So why this property and not others when when a tall building yeah. could block other people's solar access. So it that just, would be the concern. It just seems like it begs the compatibility question. Um, and I think, frankly, the city should consider an ordinance for solar access personally, but that's well, that just That would me. be our recommendation if that is a policy direction that the city wants to go in rather than doing it through this, through the development review permit process. Okay. Well, Mr. Lax indicated, and I understand where he's coming from, that there actually is not that much solar impact. I mean, sun loss impact by his building, given the orientation of both buildings, um, which I question. There's not been a shadow study done. Um, and there's no true, unless I'm mistaken, there's no true east, west, north, or south in Santa Monica, so it's kind of hard to um, predict where the sun is coming from. Um, and I, I, I suggested him that he do a shadow study, and I don't think that's happened. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, for, forgive me. I, I really just want to get some clarity on this habitable space issue because I, I you know, my understanding is that it's not just limited to residential uses, right? I mean, it, it's, uh, and it, my understanding is that it has been u applied in the past for other non-residential buildings. So I just appreciate some clarity on, on why specifically the subterranean space doesn't fall within that definition. Sure, hold on one moment. So kind of in the floor area exclusions in our code to determine floor area, it says floor area devoted to basements are excluded from the ratio. So as those are subterranean levels, basements, uh, that is why, that is one of the reasons it is not being included in the overall design of the, or the overall calculations. But doesn't the previous section, point oh eight oh include uh, habitable basements as part of a floor area definition? So that's floor area, but not floor area ratio. Right. So it's defining what floor area is, and then you have to go to the next section to determine now how do those apply to the calculation of floor area ratio. So I agree that floor area is considered, you know, there could be subterranean levels as part of floor area, but when you go to 090, the floor area ratio exemption, which is FAR, the what is allowed, uh, basements are excluded. Yeah. I uh, for me, it doesn't make any sense why you'd include it in the definition of floor area and then exclude it from the ratio. 
but uh, I'll defer to our so I think, chief city attorney. And yeah, so the, the, the concept was, and this was a change that was made um, with the 2015 code updates, was a clarification that FER is a measure of the building that is above ground. And floor area would be included, for example, if there were park, minimum parking requirements, for example, right, or any other development standard that would depend on the entire floor area of a building. But for the yeah, impact fees, um, but for the purposes of FAR and, you know, that standard of what does it mean for FAR, um, you know, it's the building that is above the ground. And so that's why the basements are excluded. Commissioner Landers. Um, I just want to, because we're trying, we are exhausting a lot of questions here. Um, and I'm thinking back to a DR we did some years ago where there were some concerns about privacy. I think it was one of Commissioner Raskin's early meetings, and he raised some concerns about privacy between two properties. And the commission at that time um, did not agree with Commissioner Raskin because there was not an expectation of privacy in the spaces where the, there was overlook because people were exiting their individual units and entering a common area where you would presume to be not in, in privacy. Here, I'm wondering whether staff evaluated, I know you spoke to the privacy screens, but my understanding of the design as submitted, and we'll, we'll hear more about the applicant, I just want to understand where we are, um, is that there is some direct view uh, to the Western project directly into a handful of apartments. Um, there's on the east side, I think it's not as, uh, I think it's not as lined up on the west side, but it's pretty direct. Um, what had, did you evaluate that? Number one. And number two, um, what is the city's standards with respect to privacy rights? Um, literally from one living area to another, whether for the hotel guests or for the um, residents of this uh, building to the west. So there's no, there's no development standard, um, at least in the code, that can be applied to neighboring properties and how windows line up to each other, at least not in the downtown district. Um, so that wasn't exactly evaluated for code compliance. Um, unfortunately, Neighboring buildings will always have potential privacy issues, you know, anywhere in the city. Um, but I think the ar architect did their best to try to avoid as much lining up as possible. As far as um, the screening that I kind of touched upon, that was an A or B comment that it wasn't actually um, privacy between the development and the neighboring property. It was between each guest room, um, if I remember correctly. Um, which that was kind of how it was the screenings and the, uh, the trellises were incorporated. Thank you very much. I believe we've come to the end of our questions for you, for the moment. <laughs> so at this point, I'd like to turn to the applicant. And the applicant now he has 15 minutes to make his presentation, and he'll have an opportunity to rebut anything that's brought up in public testimony of three minutes. <clears throat> uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm uh, Grant Carpenter with the property owner XYZ Rent. So we're a local Santa Monica company. Um, we own a number of properties in the area and we're deeply committed to the city. Uh, in addition to developing the property, we also intend on operating it as well. So it'll be a locally operated hotel, uh, deeply embedded within the community, not some you know, large outside national corporation coming in. Um, I want to make sure I leave enough time for our uh, project team to fill you guys in, so I'll uh, introduce them now. Uh, here's Howard Lax. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. This has been amazing. Three years, it's good to be back standing up here and not seeing all of you on a monitor it's it's actually very comfortable yeah there we go team can you hear me now okay okay great so um <clears throat> i'm howard lax howard lax architects i'm the architect for 516 colorado uh parham is my associate architect on the project and we'll be running the slideshow tonight as well 
I also have here tonight our landscape architect. Um, there's going to be, I'm assuming, a lot of landscape questions regarding privacy. I've invited him to join us, so he's here behind me. I've also invited our traffic engineer, David Schinder, who's out in the back, and to talk about uh, traffic operations, off-site parking, and uh, the back alley, and anything else that you feel that's important to discuss tonight. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> I think Ross did a great job of uh, on his staff report, so I'm going to move th through these very, very quickly and more focus on a lot of the questions that a lot of you had today and a lot of the questions that I've had with, uh, with Tara over there at Community Corp in the past few days, and maybe we can um, help to answer a lot of those questions as well. Okay, next slide. Um, you know the site between uh, the two buildings, 502 and 520 Colorado, and <clears throat> next slide. The property, as Ross mentioned, is very narrow. It's only 41 feet 9 inches wide by your standard 150 feet deep from Colorado back to the alley. This has been very, very challenging. One of the reasons why we're not providing parking because we can't even get parking to work in uh, on the site whatsoever. <clears throat> as staff said, the alley is one way. So right where the alley heads west to 5th Street, which is the off-ramp to the 10 freeway, it's a dead end. So we looked at options of uh, doing three-point turns and pick up along the back alley. That wouldn't work. We also looked at a, <clears throat> a drop-off area along Colorado in front of the building, but that would not work. However, we do have to bring um, guests in, have them drop off, drop off their luggage, and this was the best solution to go in and out. We'll talk about that in more detail as well next. Okay. As discussed already, the project description is eight stories, two levels, downtown community plan, 41 feet 9 inches by 150. Our allowable FAR is 3.5, we're at 3.47. Our building height is at 84 feet, which is allowed within the TA district. And then our ground floor height for pedestrian-oriented design, 11 feet minimum. Maximum is 16 feet. We are at 15 feet. Next. And I'm going to run through these renderings fast. Next. Night shot. Next. Run shot. Now, this shot, you can see the red car as it's going east <clears throat> on um, Colorado, it makes a right turn into a 10-foot driveway. And next slide. And the car is pulled to the left in a loading zone. There's three loading, um, short-term loading zone spaces underneath the building. Um, <clears throat> the luggage is dropped off. The guests are dropped off. And then we have an attendant that will take the car. Next. And the green dash line represents the vehicle pattern of the car. Then you see the three loading spaces. The, pedest the uh, guests uh, come out of the car, go into the reception area, reception desk, and then, of course, up to the room with the two elevators to their right. We do have a outdoor dining area, and um, you're right. We definitely need a way to bring food up there. So in the basement, there'll be a preparation kitchen. And one of the commissioners and myself talked about this. There will be most likely, as we get further into the detail, a dumb waiter that will bring up um, light food, coffee, um, pastries, and that sort of thing um, up there. But there will be a dumb waiter that will be added in that area, which is relatively small. As you leave the building, you're going to make a left turn down the alley to 6th Street. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay. There's the red car again, making a left turn out to 6th Street. Uh, the big blue bus did have some concerns during um, the initial review. They have reviewed it in detail with uh, David Schinder, our traffic engineer, and we have received a letter that they're in total support of us using the back alley and entering 6th Street at the um, east corner of the alley. Next. Okay. The rooms are pretty straightforward. Um, we have most of the architecture is facing Colorado and facing um, <clears throat> the back alley. We can't do a lot on the side elevations. Again, we are at 41 feet 9 inches. We did, um, when I designed this building, I did my very best to create privacy to Community Corp next, next door. Um, 
in the in the uh, TA zone, we are not required to provide um, lower level um, setbacks. Next. And as you can see, as we go up the room, and maybe you can go back and forth, the rooms stagger um, on Colorado and and uh, and the back alley. That's providing some building architect uh, architect articula articulation and as well as um, some open space. Next, okay. This is a typical guest room looking um, out toward the Hampton and the courtyard and down Colorado towards Santa Monica Place. Next. And then um, this is also on the fifth floor, looking um, actually looking um, south toward the Hilton Hotel and over the 10 freeway. So again, the rooms are identical on the north and the south. Next. And this is floor number six, same stack all the way up. And on floor number six, typical room that you can look straight down Colorado, wonderful view down uh, past the Sears building, Santa Monica Place, and out toward the Santa Monica Pier. Next. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is Community Corp. This is their east elevation. This photograph was taken at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on February, February uh, 17th. Um, the building does have um, some shadow on the building now with no building here. However, what we want to do is be good neighbors. We want to work with Community Corp. So ever since we have met with a few of the tenants, and we did have a community meeting, by the way, and also with uh, Tara, um, we have done everything we can to help mitigate privacy um, and as much as we can. There is a nine-foot setback between their um, east elevation and the property line. And they do have a palm tree, which, of course, we are sensi sensitive to that as well, too. There are <clears throat> four um, studios um, on the south side of their building. You can see with the cursor. Those small windows are their bathrooms. And then over on the north side, we also have a flip-flop of the studios and the small windows. Next. This is an interesting diagram because it's showing the green area is the open space between our building and Community Corp. And of course, the open space at Step Up at, at 520 Colorado, which um, is directly east of us. Let's focus on CCSM. Um, <clears throat> right there, we have a solid line on CCSM. That is a solid wall. Then they have their window to that studio, and then a solid wall again and window where at the same time, our solid walls are the red lines. So they are looking at our wall, not a window. However, their small window, if you can take the cursor, Parham, is looking into our courtyard. And there's a 19-foot um, open space between our building and their building. And then, of course, for our guest rooms, we also need some natural light and windows as well. The unit number, I guess it would be number four, has a window facing south, and then window number six is facing north. One of the things that we responded to originally when we met with ARB is we provided some um, vertical um, uh, cable vines that go up, and our landscape architect is here to describe that. Also, too, for more added pri per, uh, privacy, we um, can um, talk about some conditions to add privacy to those windows that are facing Community Corp. But there is open space between the two. The next part uh, of the CCSM are solid walls, which is their elevator and their stairs, which basically we also have a solid wall at that location. And then, of course, it's repeated again where we have our 19-foot plus their nine foot setback or 10 plus nine foot setback, giving us 19 feet to our room that you see where the cursor is a little bit, up a little bit. Uh -huh. And then the same windows facing north and south. <clears throat> the one area that um, was brought up to us is the window, <clears throat> is the last unit where there is a window facing one of our units. On every alternate floor, there is a balcony where that triangle is. And if you can take your cursor and circle that triangle. So we've added some more privacy there on the upper floor, and you'll see that with the landscape plans. At least you could do that when, when there's questions, uh, if we run out of time. Uh, step up, 520 Colorado. 
Um, our solid walls, they're up against their property. We're up against our property, so we share a similar property line. We have no guest rooms on that side of the building. The two guest rooms that we do have are facing directly north and facing south. And they have a 13 foot by 68 uh, courtyard um, north, um, excuse me, east of our building. And again, there are no windows facing their windows. Next. Okay, this is an interesting diagram. It's showing our building. The blue are not windows. Those are photovoltaic panels. And we also do have a solar study, um, Commissioner Lambert, which we can show you, okay? Uh -huh. And we do not cast shadow on the roof of Community Corp, okay? We do not. Um, and we can show that to you because we are east of them and uh, they should get, I would say, 90% sun during the day, okay? Um, those little squares are showing how far their windows are um, to our building. Those say, I think, nine feet. It's hard to see it. Maybe I can look nine here, feet. nine feet. And then their bathroom windows are 19 feet to our building. And then you can see the vines that are providing some privacy between um, our courtyard, our windows, and their building. The middle section of 502 Colorado has no windows. We have no windows. Those two horizontal lines or blank areas are pedestrian bridges at uh, uh, 502 Colorado, CCM, uh, CC Santa Monica. And then over to the south, it's a flip-flop. We have the small windows, which are nine feet from our building. And then their studio windows are 10 to 19 feet from um, every other floor where we do have a balcony, which will be protected, and we can work on landscaping as well, even more so than what we have provided in the, la in the last couple of days. Next. Okay. This is a picture of our elevation. Again, those are photovoltaic panels above their building, and then our landscaping. Next slide. <clears throat> this is 520 Colorado. Our blank walls are up against their blank walls, and... Um, then their courtyard. This is a real typical pattern in the downtown district for housing at 5th Street, 6th Street, and 7th Street and beyond, um, where basically the buildings are up against each other, and we are sensitive to, again, the privacy um, and the light, of course, um, of our neighbors. Next. Okay. Same image again. We already reviewed it. Next. And then this is 520 Colorado. The blue is their building up against our building. So you can see they have solid walls where, where their blue is, and then our solid walls, and then their courtyard. What we do have is our open corridors that connect the north to the south and our elevator core. Next. Okay. Rooftop. Our rooftop, which is food and beverage, is at 75 feet. The top of their building is at 50 feet, and its step up is at 61 feet, so we are about 25 feet higher, our food and beverage. And I understand the issue um, about sound, and we are sensitive to that, and we will work out with Community Corp any sound issues. Like, for example, right between our kitchen, <clears throat> which is a solid wall, uh, our kitchen and storage room, which is the red solid wall, and then... Um, <clears throat> Our bathrooms and then the guest rooms those are all solid walls. What we can do is create another solid wall between their, our bar area and our kitchen, and that could be glass because we have quite a nice view because we are 25 feet higher. That is the end of your time, but I have a question where there are other key elements that of questions that we ask that you feel you need to respond to, because I think there's a few other questions out there that... Yeah, well, what we can do that is um, maybe you can ask me the questions again, and I can jump the slides around. I know you had a lot of them, okay. um, but I'm here to answer those questions. And again, our traffic engineer is here, and also um, landscape is here. So between all of us, we can answer those questions for you. Okay, I think that... That makes sense. If you yeah. don't have anything else you have to say to us, um, then I'm going to open this up to questions. And I got Commissioner Lambert. Uh, thank you. I um, when we met, we talked about putting a, a temporary transparent, not transparent screen up at your patio areas until the plants grew to the point where privacy was ensured. Are you yes. still amenable to that? Yes, we are. And that was reviewed by um, by Grant. 
and also by uh, the owner, and that is fine. So you would accept that as a condition? Yes. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Why don't you come a little bit closer in case I, I can't answer the questions? Get it on the record. Uh, yes. Yes, we can accept that as a condition. Great, thank you. Um, we also talked about flipping the building, which seemed like such a simple solution to get the units over to the other side, and you explained why that wasn't possible. Can you do that again? Well, yeah, and we looked at it even more. It basically requires a complete whole new design of the whole project. But there are also setback issues, weren't there? Yeah, there are some setback issues. Basically, we're transferring the problem to the other side, um, to the east side. And um, at the same time, too, we are right we have to redesign our traffic, our our back alley and the access for transformers. Everything gets revised and changed again in terms of but doing that. But it really was a setback issue you said was the Yeah, and, and it is a setback okay. issue as well too. And the front setback, right? Was and there any can you, conf that, can yeah. you confirm from your plans that there's really only one window in the hotel that looks over to a window at the CCSM project, and that window in the CCM project is a bathroom window, correct? Yes, and we can go back to that. Um, no, I, I remember it, but I just want to confirm that. Yes. That's, yeah. Uh -huh. So, so that's the one privacy issue um, so far, and you would be amenable to doing some kind of ripple glass or whatever that. Um, well, we talked about that. I don't know if a um, frosted glass would be maybe the best solution. One of the solutions that um, <clears throat> that we discussed yesterday is we have louvers on the front of the building, and we can do the same thing. You can see them up there. We can do the you same. Googles or noodles? L L Louvers. Yeah. Louvers. <laughs> we can, or we can do noodles too. <laughs> but I'm sorry. So we can do a louvered system on the front of the building, uh, like, like we have on the front of the building, and we can also apply it to any windows that have a privacy issue with cool. our neighbor. Excellent. Yeah. And that's not a problem. And that's something I have also discussed with ownership and they are fine with that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also, had, I, I wrote out a bunch of conditions I sent to staff this morning and then they sent them to you and I assume you've reviewed them and I don't know if people want to be bored by my reading through them. I mean, some of them may have the same issues I have, yeah. but they're not gospel because it's only me. Um, you should go through them. I mean, don't take a lot of time. But you I won't. I'll, re I'll read fast. Uh, under project-specific conditions, uh, we've already discussed this. Number five should be added to say temporary screening materials will be constructed on the borders of the patio areas and shall remain until the new landscaping has matured to provide, provise, to provide privacy for the residents of 502 Col Colorado. You've already said you're going to do that. And Grant can go through. Um, Grant has reviewed them, and um, there have been some... Um, suggested edits to your um, oh, cool. okay. suggestions, and we can go through each one of those now. Okay. Okay. I'll try to be fast. Um, okay. This is the effects of construction of the new project on the existing palm tree on the eastern border of 502 Colorado shall be assessed by a licensed arborist. The assessment shall be submitted to the director for review. If the effects on the palm tree cannot be mitigated, the developer shall identify a replanting site and cover the cost of relocating the palm tree. Yeah, so uh, stepping back to five, mm -hmm. uh, we're fine with the condition. That, Perfect. Uh, previous one you mentioned. I'm channeling Jerry Rubin. <laughs> and then <laughs> with the one you just mentioned there. Uh, I'm sorry? With the, tree, with the ones with the tree just mentioned there, we're okay huh? with that as well. Okay, cool. The trees in the, um, between the buildings? Yes. The relocation of the palm tree, if necessary. Okay. Uh, the rooftop area shall be fenced to mitigate noise and objects being thrown onto the adjacent properties, which I've never experienced, but apparently Tara Baraskas has. So she thought some kind of fencing around the roof to prevent people from throwing bottles onto her building, which is kind of, apparently she's had that experience. So we're okay with the condition. However, we think it's kind of vague as drafted um, in terms of you know how high would they need to be, right, I understand. how it would be interpreted. So you know, we would happen to have you know higher glass fencing there. That would be that would be. It's no hard for me to imagine that happening, but apparently that's their experience. Yeah. And there there may be code requirements about the height of a fence anyway that I'm not aware of. Do you have um, a suggestion on the height? Yes. If you, do, you have edits that you want to re raise with us right now, or I don't have any any specific re requirements. Um, more just so that, you know, down the line, we don't run into confusion as, in terms of how we actually comply with that condition. Okay. And, and also, if I, may, if I may, just for one moment, we need to I'll make sure that any sort of height limitation um, for the DCP with respect to those would not be Would that be 42 inches like everywhere else, or? Yeah. Hmm? Right. I mean, there's building, I just don't know if we're describing something higher than, like, the building code minimums and, 
you know, whether that would present Well, they're going to want to put the fencing around the roof anyway, so people don't fall off, I assume. Well, well yes, there, there, there's like required, minimum required safety fencing, <laughs> but to the extent anything bigger than that is being discussed, you know, we would need to make sure that doesn't, number one, um, exceed the maximum heights of the DCP, obviously, but obviously, and, and also not be in um, conflict with any technical codes. I understand. Okay. Um, now, when we talked about the frosted windows, whatever alternative you can come up with would be, I guess you have, the noodles, right? <laughs> yeah, the noodles would be a, very, actually a good suggestion. Yeah. And then finally, um, under project operations, the rooftop restaurant and bar shall operate only during the hours of 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. And that was just my thought. I don't know how, there, how other commissioners feel about that. But there should be, I think, some limits on the hours of operation on the roof, which I would imagine would be okay, so depending on what they are, would be acceptable to you. So preferably not, and that's largely because we don't really have a sense yet that there actually will be a noise issue to mitigate. Um, so if there's not going to be a noise issue to mitigate, it seems a little premature now to say that uh, 10 p.m. is necessary to mitigate you know, noise after 10 p.m. if it's not going to actually uh, spread down to the units on the adjacent project. Well, it's, it's very par for the course for us to put operating hours into the, some projects like this. So we do that with CUPs and DRPs. So we, we are okay with that. Um, you know, preferably not, but but we can we can work with that. Okay. Uh, no amplified music on the roof. It, it's similar to the last one, um, it, it might not be necessary. Um, and then the definition of amplified does that include any music at all played from speakers, or is that above a certain a certain volume? Um, you know, if, if it's not necessary, we'd rather not have the condition. Um, for example, one of the conditions in the um, the staff proposed. Um, findings for tonight, it includes a condition that the you know, property and its use don't interfere with the neighbors. So that's, that would be covered in, under that. It's a little, a little more, uh, leaves a little more room for, for us to actually you know, maximize the use of the property while ensuring we don't violate the, uh, the rights of the neighbors next door. Um, you know, however, uh, if, if the commission you know, really, really wants like, a firm requirement there, uh, we can we can agree to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally, if I lived in the CCSM building, the step up building, I wouldn't want amplified music coming off the roof next door if it were eleven o'clock at night. I mean, that's just not that's yeah. not compatible. That's use. Where, that where it comes comes into you know, is it going to be like very light jazz that no one's going to hear no matter what, or is it going to be you know, blaring rock music? Um, it obviously, would never be blaring rock music, but maybe some light jazz that's played at you know speaking volume, no one would be hearing that. So it doesn't really make sense to necessarily. You know, prevent us from doing that. That said, you know, this is not a, you know, deal killer for us. We okay, can, you don't see it as like a rock venue. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, just no idling automobiles in the drive through because that's sort of a, obviously an air quality issue. Um, and then, and then finally, finally, um, the CCSM property is not air conditioned. And construction is going to be very difficult as it is for those people because they're not well. They're not going to be able to open their windows because of dust and what have you. How would you propose to mitigate that? Uh, could you guys speak to that by chance? Yeah. Well, in the past, um, I think the commission um, has provided some construction mitigation mm -hmm. requirements. So we're open to. Um, a list of construction mitigation that we would have to follow during the construction phase. I'm just concerned about these people not being able to open their windows for 18 yeah. months. I mean, that's kind of a, that's a problem. <clears throat> yeah. Um, that's something that um, probably needs to be discussed how we can best right, do right. that. Yeah. So, um, I don't have a solution yet. I assume that installing air conditioning in their building is probably not on the table, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Or maybe even just for those units that face the construction site. Uh, just something to talk about or think about for okay. the future. Yeah, and, and that's something that I think we can talk about. Um, Eight units. That are and thank you for the shadow study. You did that since Tuesday? Yes. Good for you. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Commissioner Landers. So I'm... I have. I, I actually would like to hear about the traffic study. Um, I'll start with that. I have okay. other questions, but I'm. I'm making. I'm looking. I'm sort of looking at the site, and I'm concerned about. Concerned about curb cut issues um, for cyclists, but I don't want to make any assumptions until I hear. 
And if you could just state your <laughs> yes. name again. Uh, David Schender, uh, Lynn Scott along Greenspan. So um, what, what did you find <laughs> from your review of, particularly of cycling traffic? With respect to the uh, cycling traffic, uh, well, you we can see we've accommodated a, a cyclist coming onto the site. Uh, with respect to your question about uh, curb cut at the site vis-a-vis -vis, uh, bikes having to turn, uh, or I'm sorry, vehicles having right. to turn uh, at 6th Street, I mean, we still get the same, uh, I guess, called conflict between whether the car turns into the site at the driveway or the car turns uh, at 6th Street, there will always be that uh, uh, conflict between the the, ped, or the bicyclists and the, uh, the vehicle. Uh, we think it's better to have vehicles come into the site at this location uh, because otherwise we could foresee, uh, particularly with Uber or Lyft, uh, the cars are just going to stop in the middle of Colorado and, uh, you know, drop off, pick up passengers. And I think that would create uh, uh, greater potential dangers to, to bicyclists. Uh, under that scenario. So bear with me here, please, because I, I, I want to be fair to you and I, and I want to acknowledge as well that there is actually further east, to the east of the um, step-up property, there are actually some parking spaces on the street that require a right turn. The distinction, and this is why I was asking you about the study, is my working assumption is that many, not all, but many, maybe even a majority of the car uh, of vehicle traffic will be coming off the 10 westbound, getting off at 5th, coming up 5th, and making a right on, uh, onto Colorado. Cyclists who are coming off the Esplanade, um, I will editorialize that this is one of the worst designed um, cycle tracks in the city of Santa Monica, if not the worst, uh, because you get to the you get to a dead end in the middle of, of Colorado and Forth, as you all know, and then you kind of look around and go, wait, am I supposed to go up this alley? Am I supposed to go on the sidewalk? What am I supposed to do? Um, but fundamentally, a lot of people make their way to the corner of Fifth and Colorado, point their bikes south, and then hang a left onto Colorado, right? So my concern, and what happens is, and forgive me, like you're going to have this right past the corner. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. Commissioner? Yeah, uh, Commissioner, okay. we, can't, we can't. Maybe turn off. And you got to turn off your mic yeah. too, but you're interrupting somebody Thank else speaking. You. We're going to see a conflict right at that turn because by the time they get to 6th, everybody's heading safely in the same direction. Cyclists are, it's a Sharrows, right? Yes. How are you, how are you addressing this, um, this crossing right there? That's what I'm, that's, I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at an overhead view of the, of the street. I'm looking, and I just, I, I'm concerned because I think somebody's going to come off the freeway. It can happen now anyway, but, at least with, with no curb cut, they, they're going straight. They're not immediately hanging a right. Sorry. But I, I understand the concern about what happens at 5th in Colorado. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, we're far enough to the uh, east of the intersection that, again, that a vehicle turning right into the driveway, you know, hopefully they'll use their signal, they'll be aware of any cyclists, and they'll turn uh, safely into uh, the site. Uh, and again, uh, as I brought up, uh, we, we don't want to see cars uh, stopping in the middle of Colorado, which would impede uh, bicyclists. And, and then again, uh, finally, I would say, uh, because there is no on-site parking, the number of vehicles actually coming into the site is actually relatively minimal. Uh, for example, we did uh, in our studies, uh, we did some counts of cars going into the courtyard and, and the Hampton Inn which do have on-site parking, and it's in the range of 10 to 15 cars per hour entering uh, those hotels, uh, and those are much bigger hotels. So, you know, I could foresee that this hotel would maybe see in the range of 5 to 10 cars coming in uh, over an hour during the peak hour. So that's, you know, one car coming in every, you know, 5 to 10 minutes. So it, it's not going to be a, a big volume of vehicles turning into this hotel. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I have a couple of other questions um, following Commissioner Lambert's questions. Um, on the amplification issue, and I don't know if this is a solve, but it strikes me that would you be open to a, however else we work out the amplification restriction, would you be open to a, to a restriction on any speakers facing either of the neighboring units so that if you're going to have speakers, they have to be pointed away from those apartments? I think that's extremely fair. I think that's in line with what we would do anyway. It's also kind of worth noting that the, um, you know, the, the bar area and the seating area does face out towards Colorado. So just generally speaking, uh, sound will be going, you know, out towards Colorado and right. upwards generally. But absolutely, speakers, if that does condition, whether or not it's condition, we'll definitely do that. Okay, thanks. Um, a second, would you be open to, and I think this is something we would discuss anyway, but in the past, with, particularly with CUPs, where we're unsure of what the sort of impact on the neighbors would be, we've, op we've put in a one or two year period um, where uh, staff collects um, collects potential complaints and then assesses whether or not that the CUP needs to be brought back to the commission for further review. In other words, if everything goes the way you think it goes, we're done. And if it doesn't, then you might find us find yourselves back here for a review of your CUP. Can you live with that? I think that's you know very reasonable and preferable to kind of just throwing in you know kind of like quickly drawn together firm guidelines now. Um, I think that's very reasonable. Okay, and then um, and this is goes to construction mitigation. I think um, Commissioner Lambert raised the question uh, regarding the units at 502. Um, it strikes me that. Um, air conditioning and air filtration during the period of construction for those units would be absolutely appropriate. It would be the bare minimum. Um, I also wonder whether, um, as a mitigation, you would be open potentially once you pull those air conditioning units after the construction to making sure that those windows get double-paned glass. Um, should that be something that, that, that 502 would want, if it's deemed necessary? I think this would fall within your earlier comment uh, with regard to the uh, you know the one or two year period where we can assess the necessity for that. Um, just you know, my intuition is that I don't think it's actually going to be an issue with the noise coming down all the way off the rooftop. Okay, but you so but you would be open to including mitigation of neighbor impacts in that one to two year review period. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Any other questions, Mr. Col Commissioner? Yeah, I, I had a traffic get, question. Get. I had a traffic question. Sorry. You've got three cars stacking in the in the driveway. I've driven that street several times to look at the site, and there's only one lane that goes by that. And if that traffic backs up into that one lane, you're going to be stacking up people. How do you mitigate that? Either valet go, is in a hurry or something like that. Sure. Uh, under an unusual circumstance, if there was a surge of vehicles that came to the site, uh, the, the valets can rearrange the vehicles on the property. I think we did a study that showed we can get up to 10 cars queued within the site before they back out onto Colorado. So again, because it, the valleys will be there, they can move the cars uh, further to, I guess that would be the south, and, and queue up into the drive lane so that cars don't back out onto Colorado. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shender, can you can I ask you a couple questions? Please. Um, so to me, the biggest compatibility issue is this access point along the street. And all the other projects take their access off of the off of the the rear, um, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm in trouble even articulating this question, but I I'm concerned about this and like if somebody so the good news is there's not parking, so people aren't going to be these aren't going to be tourists coming here looking for this parking this place and circling around, but there will be Uber drivers and stuff like that, and if you miss this driveway, you have to go all the way up to Seventh and around, and it's pretty it's a pretty big thing. So how are you guys? 
what are you doing to assure me that this isn't just going to be people having to loop around here because they can't find this spot? Because when you come off and go around that turn, you know what happens pretty quickly, this, this, this spot. Right. So it, it's obviously the uh, kind of the push-pull between, uh, you know, we've heard comments of the team about uh, enhancing the, the, the pedestrian entry into the site. So uh, if you make the pedestrian entry wider, that means the driveway gets smaller. So uh, that's, you know, some of the challenges that we deal with, uh, particularly on this narrow site. Uh, I would say it's it's probably parts of, of signage and, pro and also uh, the improved, you know, wayfinding that uh, you know, ways and, and Google Maps and Apple Maps uh, provides these days that says, you know, you, you've arrived and, you know, I guess luckily it will be essentially the only curb cut in this uh, particular section. So uh, it should be readily apparent to someone who's not familiar with the area. Okay, I've, I've arrived. I need to turn here. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate you doing that. I still have a little discomfort about that, but I guess we'll, we'll talk through it. Any other uh, Vice Chair? Yeah, well, and I've got a traffic question myself. Sorry to make you come back. Um, I think Commissioner Landers raised some really compelling points. Um, and, uh, you know, to those points, is it fair to assume that there might be cars that are stopping suddenly to turn into the space? Uh, yes, because, it, well, I wouldn't say suddenly, but you will certainly need to be driving slowly to be able to turn into the site. It, it is a, a relatively narrow driveway at 10 feet, uh, and you're turning in off of a, a street that has essentially only one lane. So uh, vehicles will need to be driving slowly uh, as they approach the driveway to make a safe turn into the site. Uh, you know, the slow movement of, of travel obviously is in turn beneficial to uh, bicyclists and, and also pedestrians because uh, vehicles won't be whipping into the, the site uh, off of Colorado. Uh, but again, it comes down to uh, to good signage, uh, the fact that it would be the only driveway, so you know a drive a driver doesn't have to pick and choose between which curb cut to enter, uh, and and also just the improvements that have come uh, to the to the um, uh, driver assist uh, uh, applications, uh, saying when you arrived at your destination. And do do you happen to know what the speed limit is in Colorado? I I don't know offhand. I would guess it's 25 to 30 miles per hour. And if you calculated how slowly you'd have to, de you know, go in order to turn into that space, uh, yeah, that would probably to safely turn in would be probably no more than five miles per hour. So, I mean, just for the record, we're talking about cars going down from 30 to five, right? Right, uh, but again, uh, because of this portion of Colorado. Uh, you know, they would have been turning off of uh, Fish Street, essentially, to get to this site. So they're not approaching at 30 miles per hour. They would have just turned off of Fish Street uh, to, to get to this portion of Colorado. All right, I've got just a few more questions. I'll be quick. Uh, right. Just for the, um, Mr. Lax, if you could just uh, tell me, uh, what did you have in mind for the back of house space? at the lowest level of the basement. <clears throat> All right, so we can go to that plan. <clears throat> so there, there's two levels of basement, lower and upper. I am not 100% sure that the lower level will be <clears throat> actually um, um, included in the project. At this time, I was asked to do it. It's not been programmed at all, um, so we're not quite sure whether or not that will be um, added. A lot of it has to do with construction costs and the costs of where things are right now in terms of uh, inflation and so forth that may be um, engineered out. <clears throat> On the upper level, we can go to that. Right now at this time, we have our long-term parking. We have a banquet room. We have our kitchen. We have a business center. And we have a fitness center. And we have bathrooms, which are associated with the bicycles and the fitness center. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, just uh, for our own knowledge, have you all had a chance to review uh, Mr. Sison's letter? I just got it today. 
Okay. Yeah, I have not had a chance to look at it. And uh, uh, yes, I have had a chance to uh, review it. Okay. Uh, I'll hold off my questions there and save the rest for our discussion. Well, I'm just going to follow up on that one question that you had about the basement level and the showers and the lockers. Mm -hmm. um, are those for uh, staff as well as employee? I mean, employees as well as guests? Yes. Yes. So we have long-term bicycle storage, which would be for employees. And they could also be for guests, depending upon um, the operator and how they want to work it. And that's what we've done at the proper hotel. Our bicycles over there, the proper, are for guests, and they are also for employees. Right, because I imagine with no parking, you're going to see a lot of transit use, and we hope a lot of bike bike use. So I, I want to make sure, and if we have to condition it, whatever it is, I want to make sure that it's for both the employees and the... And that's fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a question? Um, I saw Commissioner Lambert's hand first. And then Sorry, I'm faster on the draw. <laughs> um, is, is there some sort of locker room for employees where they can change and leave their stuff? And yeah. um, in the sh we have a shower, we have a shower area, and then um, there will be lockers and a dressing room as well. Um, right now, it's programmed for uh, showers and then um, a drying area. I'm looking at the screen down here, and of course, sinks and toilets as well. And um, then, of course, we have um, additional bathrooms, which is for members of the public, um, if there is a banquet in the in the banquet room. Do you have a break room for employees, or is that? No, but if that's something that we have to add, which I'm sure that, um, depending upon whether or not we work on a neutrality. You have to volunteer it. Yeah, and that, okay. would, be, that would be added as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, has anyone done a, uh, tra I don't think you have, a uh, traffic study of Colorado? Because I use Colorado as my secret way to get downtown because I encounter no traffic whatsoever. So Commissioner um, Raskin brought up the, the idea of traffic being backed up and what have you, but my experience is there are very few cars on Colorado. <coughs> uh, again, David Schender, uh, there was no specific study of Colorado done for this project uh, in the vehicle miles traveled world. Uh, uh, it don't look so much at uh, level of surface so much anymore, but yes, uh, your experience is correct because that is really the beginning of the eastbound portion of, of Colorado, uh, you know, after the downtown station. So yes, there's relatively minimal amount of vehicles that using that portion of Colorado. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I would say, too, I, I take my bicycle from my office at Colorado and um, 12th Street um, down to Santa Monica downtown. I always take Colorado because it's safer. It's quiet. There's not a lot of traffic versus Broadway or Santa Monica Boulevard. Okay, another round of another round here. So um, I have a design question, and then I have a um, question for staff before I... At, that's related to a question I want to ask you. Um, so on the design question, there's a lot happening underground, yes? Have you given any thought to light wells? Um, no, we have not. Because? Uh, there's really no opportunity for light wells. We can go back to it, but we, again, we have um, zero setbacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have maybe a little bit of opportunity in the front of the building, but that we have a driveway there, and then we have our entrance, as you could see, and then we have our outdoor dining area. Along the back, we have our loading zone, we have our transformer yard, and we have our RRR area. So I would say for light wells, <clears throat> very unlikely, okay. unless I start carving away the building. Right. No, I, I understand that. I'm just I'm just noticing that there's quite a lot happening underground. And when we, there was a project we looked at a few years ago, the one with all that extra parking next to the metro station, and I remember a long conversation about what was going on on the basement levels and what that how that was going to feel. And that was for a project that included housing, and this doesn't. Um, so it's on my mind. Uh, so here's my question for the planning manager. Um, <clears throat> There are probably some things that we could, we as the city of Santa Monica, could do at that intersection to deconflict bike and vehicle traffic. There's no, there's not a ban on right turns on Red, northbound Fifth to eastbound Colorado. 
Um, there's a leading pedestrian interval, but we don't have a specific bike green southbound fifth to eastbound Colorado. Are there any provisions that could enable those to be financed by the applicant in order to deconflict the intersection? So this th this application is not a development agreement. It's just a regular permit. Um, and just like any other project, they would have to pay um, transportation impact uh, fees, you know, that go towards those sorts of improvements. Um, you know, but we're not in a position to negotiate or request more, um, you know, than the uh, code requires. Obviously, as a tier three downtown project, they also pay enhanced um, impact fees, you know, per what is required um, in the code for, for tier three downtown projects. Uh, okay, and could we, um, as the commission, should we choose to formalize a request that the mobility consider deconflicting actions um, independent of a DRP here or a CUP? Um, certainly as additional, you know, direction outside of your vote on the project, um, we can communicate that to the mobility division, you know, in terms of concerns around that intersection or what have you. Okay. Happy to help communicate that. And if the, and I'm trying to get, and, and now I'm thinking about findings. If we're looking at compatibility, harmoniousness, um, would the absence of would the would the presence of the conflict create a condition create a situation where it would make it more difficult legitimately to make the finding that there is compatibility and harmoniousness? In other words, I think I, I'm trying to understand because I'm I'm trying to understand whether I can make the findings, and I know how to deconflict that intersection so that I wouldn't have an objection, but that intersection is not yet deconflicted. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one thing to, that is an existing condition, right? It is not okay. something this project created, nor, you know, arguably right. is it exacerbating. Like, it is there, and if you're noticing it is something that is, you know, you, you, you perceive as a conflict or that needs to be fixed, again, that is separate and independent from, you know, this particular project. Okay. If that makes sense. Thank you. I'm wondering, so I'll just put it to the staff, uh, to the applicant. Do you think that there are anything, there's anything that you can do on the property? A number of us have asked questions about backed up traffic, about sudden stops for abrupt right turns, and potential merging issues, um, because this is a, sh technically there, sh it, there shouldn't be a cross, because this is a Sharrows, which is the least good type of bike lane. We can all agree to that. Um, is there anything you can do on the property with lighting, with signage, with something to drop to, to, to um, you know, try to make it a little bit of a safer turn? So uh, I'll, I'll let the rest of the team answer their question, but I'll bring up a kind of related point. Um, just to confirm that there is no right on red onto Colorado from fifth there. Just there, you... there isn't a ban. There's, I just had someone it's, you're allowed to make a right on red. Uh, I, I, you're not allowed to make a right on red there. Are you sure? Someone texted me a screenshot of the sign saying no right on red. Oh, really? Okay. That's that's super helpful. Okay. But do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, just. Um, we have not looked at our sign program yet, and that's something that we will be doing when we go back to the Architectural Review Board. And that's something I can work with staff on <clears throat> maybe possibly a monument sign or something along the um, public right-of-way on our property that helps to identify that the um, driveway for the hotel is forthcoming. Thank you. One final question, I promise. Yes. Um, I'm a little confused about where we are on the conditions that I read a little while ago. Um, okay. Do you want to address them again so, um, so we can proceed and maybe get a stoa tonight? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll refer to them by the uh, the numbers from the email you sent. So right. The first one is five. Um, so on, on the uh, five, the temporary screen materials, we're okay with that. Okay. Uh, six, the um, palm tree, we're okay with that. Uh, seven, uh, okay with that. That's in line with our... Our current intentions. Which is it? Because we don't have. They don't have what you guys. Sorry. Would. So seven is the uh, rooftop area shall be fenced to 
mitigate noise and objects being thrown off the adjacent properties. So, you know, uh, pursuant to what I discussed with uh, Commissioner Landres, um, you know, we, we would like that done, you know, with, with uh, an assessment being done a year or two after the property right. opens to, right. to determine whether there's a need for well, that. Well, we'll put that in anyway, that like after one year or two years or whatever, there'll be a review of the CUP. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm, actually, I'm not I sure. I don't know how feasible eight is since there's no light. Yeah, I'm not sure we discussed eight, actually. I, I don't. Eight oh, is right. landscaping Land shall be planted between the property and 502 Colorado to enhance privacy. Uh, I don't think that's necessary given the mitigation measures. We've well, I'm also not discussed. sure what could live in that space. Yeah, and I think with the setback they have, it's set back higher up, but down low, I believe the structure yeah. is there. I'm not, I'm not sure that's feasible. And when you say 18 feet, that it, from the patio of your place, the actual walls are only eight feet apart and nine feet apart. So there's not a whole lot you could plant there. Yeah. Mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, there's not. There's there's eight feet um, on the um, hmm? community corp property. Yeah. Eight to nine is nine feet. Eight feet in the back on community corp, and right now it is uh, concrete. It may even be a fire access to get around. Yeah, the I don't think that's required. probably not a realistic thing to ask mm -hmm. for, and yeah. it'd be worthless anyway. Yeah, and we have nothing on our side except at the podium deck, which Sitting is between the buildings. Mushrooms. I mean, we could do a cottage industry with mushrooms. Right? <laughs> uh, and and so at the second floor we have of course our courtyard right, 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 right. our landscape and you're going to do temporary screening until that those plants have grown that's correct yes uh, and the frosted windows we've settled another way which I can't remember louvers, I, louvers okay <laughs> those the louvers noodles, noodles yes. okay <laughs> and the number twenty five under project operations the rooftop restaurant and bar shall operate only during the hours of eight and ten you you object to putting an hours of operation in. You have, a, you have a hotel unit up there, right? Uh, uh, yes, two on the portion facing the uh, alleyway. Well, it would sort of behoove you not to have wild and crazy things going on at midnight up there with yeah, the hotel I, I mentioned that earlier. Our, yeah. our, our incentives are in line, actually, with the uh, neighboring properties. I mean, probably even more so since we have to you know, worry about customers being right. upset. Um, so that's why you know, we, we have the incentive. We're going to mitigate it anyway, so I understand. we're happy to work to mitigate right. it. You don't want them to be really unhappy and throwing things onto the building next door. Exactly. Okay. Um, no amplified music. Did we settle that by putting the speakers toward Colorado? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's not facing the. Not facing CCSM. Or 520 or 502. Um, does staff have what you guys have what I sent this morning? Am I the only one who right. has it? Yes. Yeah, so, and if I, if I may just, um, I understand you're still in questions with the applicant, but I do just want to remind the commission that you still um, are going to hear from the public this evening. And so, right. um, you know, there, there will probably likely be further discussion after that. Um, so you're just in I'm questions just right now. I'm just trying to get my mind around what they said. I haven't said, said anything yet because I'm waiting for this. Okay. And then no idling um, automobiles in the driveway. Yeah, yeah, we can we can live with that. Yeah, that was it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Do we have any other comments? I heard Commissioner Fresco, do you have comments? Well, this I don't have a question. I want to hear from the public and then I'll make my comment. Okay. So you don't have questions. Okay, great. Um applicant team, thank you very much. We've tortured you enough. We'll we'll give you three more minutes of torture in a little while. Um, and we'll turn to the public for public comment. And at this moment, after after public comment, I plan on taking. How many are there? Um, I got to like twenty, and I couldn't count. And we have four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I have to give a little levity once in a while. Okay, I have four people in front, four speakers, and again, I apologize. Jordan Sisson, John Christensen. Jennifer Kaplan and Tara Baroskas. Those are relatively easy. Good evening, Chair, Planning Commissioners. My name is Jordan Sisson. I'm a land use attorney here representing Local 11 Unite here. That includes 25,000 hospitality workers in Southern California, including 400 who live and work in Santa Monica. You see some of our members here today who uh, braved the, the weather and the traffic to be here. I thank you so much for being here. Uh, for sake of brevity of how long this meeting is, they will not be speaking tonight. I'll be summarizing our comments out of respect for your time. 
don't think it'll be more than two minutes, so I'll try to be brief. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for your questions. As a, a commissioner for my city, um, it's great to see that level of discussion and actually seeing the commissioners go through public comments that have been submitted. So I thank you, first and foremost. Tonight, we're asking for this planning commission to continue the item. Um, we think this is appropriate for multitude of reasons, and mostly so the developer has time to respond to our comments, as well as to the ample uh, back and forth conditions and really great questions that this entire planning commission has asked. There's been a lot of discussion about we haven't crossed that bridge, we haven't considered it, we haven't looked at it, maybe we'll be open to this. Um, our incentives are not in are in line to prevent these sort of things. These are a lot of things that need to be flushed out additionally, surveys and other information that hasn't even been put in the public record um, that we certainly haven't been able to see, and we would certainly enjoy the opportunity to see that. Um, obviously, we, we submitted a letter with reference earlier. You know, for, again, sake of brevity, we, we highlighted some, some concerns that we had. These include the really substandard parcel size, the rooftop uses, which many of the commissioners discussed, the ground floor design, and some of the TDM measures. Again, a lot of it was mentioned tonight. You know, we, we really do believe that the developer could address these. Um, I don't think they're insurmountable, but it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of creativity. I think you heard from Mr. Lax all the concern and time and effort to address certain components and certain concerns that was raised by the Architectural Review Board and some other folks. We think that same level of um, ingenuity and can do ness, if I could pen that word, um, could address our concerns. And I think the concerns are, are important because, um, as the letter described, they really gear towards plans, goals, policies, um, and applicable plans, and also go directly to the findings, which obviously is very important to this commission. So we, we really want to work cooperatively with the, the applicant. I've got 15 seconds. So again, for sake of brevity, we will, uh, we will not all come tonight and speak. We reserve the right to comment in the future. We'll stand by our, our comment letter, which speaks for itself. And we really do look forward to working with the city and the developer. I think um, the code provides, I think, good causes here to request a continuance. And we certainly hope the developer will agree to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Having none. OK. So um, John Christensen. My name is Joshua Christensen. I'm a, uh, I'm a representative with the Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. I uh, represent 64,000 uh, men and women uh, carpenters in Southern California, um, many who live here in the surrounding areas. Uh, we believe that uh, our workers will be impacted by uh, this uh, by this uh, by this project. Should it should require that this project should be built with contractors who hire locally, who pay fair wages, um, who utilize apprentices from the state certified apprenticeship. Um, a local workforce requirements reduces construction related environmental impacts while benefiting the local economy and workforce uh, uh, development. In a recent 2020 report putting California on the high road, a job climate action plan for 2030 California Workforce Development Board concluded that investment in growth diversifying and upskill California workforce can positively affect returns on climate mitigation efforts. The South Coast Air Quality Management District recently found that local hire requirements can reduce uh, can result in uh, reduced air pollution as well. Other cities have not hesitated to uh, uh, apply work uh, force requirements for private developments projects in their city uh, for an example uh, a city up in Northern California uh, the city of Hayward has adopted this workforce requirement into their general plan and municipal code also along uh, we find a lot of uh, wage theft we find a lot of tax fraud in projects and smaller projects like this uh, by hiring uh, uh, legitimate contractors uh, who follow these guidelines uh, would minimize those uh, those infractions and those uh, those uh, those criminal contractors that we call them today. 
again, we thank you for your time, and uh, you guys have a good day. Thanks. And again, to uh, not allow this project to go forward without those uh, requirements. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, Jennifer Kaplan. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer. I live at 502 Colorado, so I'm in the CCSM building. Um, I'd like to make sure everyone understands that on either side of this project, we have Step Up and CCSM, which is low income. My understanding is that the majority of people in those buildings have no other options to move out. It's not like another apartment building where you just go, you know what, changes in the neighborhood, eh, I'm moving. For me personally, my choices are live at CCSM or be homeless. And I think that goes for a lot of people in both buildings. Um, as my two biggest concerns are the amount of light that the buildings are gonna be deprived of. I know for CCSM, there are specific units where they will not have any direct sunlight. Someone, I'm sorry, I forgot who, made a comment about plants not being able to live off the light between the two buildings. How are we expecting people to? Um, the biggest concern I have is actually related to traffic and the one way through the hotel. That alley is already a nightmare. It's supposed to be two ways. It's not wide enough for two ways. So we already have issues where if someone's trying to exit their home, either Step Up or CCSM, and someone else is trying to get in, someone's got to back up, and sometimes it takes a while. Um, that also happens whenever the trash or recycling are picked up. Also, when any kind of repairs need to be done, whether it's like contractors to do plumbing or city employees working on the poles, they park their trucks back there. We can't come and go. It's already a nightmare, and I think that the way it's proposed now is only going to make it worse. I think it's going to be a nightmare for tenants. I think it's going to be a nightmare for, for the hotel, too. And no guest is going to walk out and be like, oh, that was a great hotel, except I couldn't get an Uber or leave when I wanted. Like, no one's going to be happy with this plan. Um, as far as traffic on Colorado, it's true that it's much less than on, on other streets. But please keep in mind, because of the train tracks running there, anything shuts the street down. Someone calls 911, police come or an ambulance. The whole time they're there, the street is shut down. You can't go anywhere. I've seen people get really upset because they're stuck in between cars and there's just nothing you can do. There's no alternatives. So any little problem because use of the space, like in theory, it's all great, but you guys are trying to put an elephant in a shoebox and nobody's gonna be happy with the results. That's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate it. Don't, don't leave. We have a question for you. We have at least one question for you. Okay. Thank you for your comment. Um, so you are regularly using the alley. That's your primary motive. How do you access your home right now? Um, well, my caregiver takes me places in the car. So if I have a doctor's appointment and the trash guy is coming and the city's doing maintenance on the wires, like, I could have to sit there for 45 minutes before I can even exit the alley. And can you can exit the alley on both sides? No, it's, it's, it's closed six. off at 6. It's closed off at 6. At 5th, right? At six. Yeah. yeah. So there's literally nowhere to go. It's not a matter of drivers having to pay attention to maneuver around each other. There's no option. And then... If you were going out, let's say you were just going to go to the Trader Joe's on 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 Fifth Street, um, how do you exit your home? If I'm going somewhere close by, just yeah. in my wheelchair, yeah. I can use the front gate. The front gate on Colorado. Yeah. 
Okay. That's not a problem. It's it's access to the rear of the building, mm-hmm. which is the garage. And so anyone who uses or relies on a car for transportation, you can just get stuck and there's nothing you can do about so it. So your, your caregiver to access your home is going east to 6th mm-hmm. or coming down 6th, going toward the big blue bus, and then hanging a right into the alley, and then hanging a sharp right into CCSM parking. Exactly. And then doing the reverse to leave. Exactly. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. That's the end of the questions. Next commenter is Tara Braskas. Good evening, Chair Risa, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tara Braskas with Community Corp. Um, first of all, I just want to say thanks to all of you. I feel like you've really listened and heard a lot of our concerns. Obviously, our building is right next door. I mean, let's face it, this an eight-story hotel is not really compatible with an apartment building, but we understand we're in the downtown. We understand this is allowable. So we really appreciate you thinking seriously about how to lessen the impacts that this project is going to have on our residents. Um, I do think construction mitigation is important. This is going to be tough on our residents, and they already deal with a lot of tough things with the expo line and everything. So I think any consideration of portable air conditioning units during construction I think would be a reasonable request at a bare minimum. Um, The relocation of the palm tree I think should be their cost to bear as well. Um, I'm really concerned about the rooftop bar. Um, We do have a building next to a hotel on 4th and Pico and people regularly throw things onto our property and there's nothing we can do to enforce it. So I think that there need to be conditions placed um, for this operating uh, the rooftop bar so I think it should be quiet should be off at 10 um, that's quiet hours at normal apartment buildings um, I don't like the idea of amplified music I don't think the burden should have to be on us to deal with this for a year and have to come back and reopen a CUP so I personally would rather see um, you know some conditions now for you know either um, well I'd like to know what the occupancy of the rooftop bar will be because I think there should be acoustic measures that take into account if there's two people up there you know then we might need a little bit more of a mitigation measure than um, you know what's currently being contemplated so I would ask you to consider that um, I think those are the I think you guys addressed a lot of our concerns I guess I'll just um, say that I hope that we can continue to have an open dialogue with the developer because this will be impactful to our residents a few of the residents have emailed me they said that this is going to feel oppressive claustrophobic one said cruel and I'm just concerned that people are going to feel like they have to move out because they're not getting any light that's something we really focus on when we design our buildings is getting light into units because that feels good for people this thing and it feel great so anything you can do to make serious strict conditions would be much appreciated thank you Commissioner Landers thank you Ms. Braskas um so I have a question Taking in everything that you said, I have sort of two questions, one broad, one specific. Um, And the fact that I'm not asking about other things is about saving time, not because I wouldn't be happy to have this conversation at greater length. I suspect Commissioner Lambert has other questions. Um, On the traffic mitigation issue, you have a bunch of frontage that is your private property um, where conceivably a sign could go up saying, something like cars and bikes need to, I mean, some appropriate sign alerting people to to watch out for cross traffic or watch out for bike traffic. Um, Under the appropriate circumstances, not in the jurisdiction of this commission, would you ever consider putting a sign like that up? Theoretically? I guess, sure. Okay, which leads to the larger question. Mr. Sisson um, recommended a continuance. do you believe that if you had more time with the applicant's um, consent, right, because we'd have to give them, they'd have to agree to this, that some of the issues that have been raised tonight could be worked out between the private parties prior to a return to the commission? 
I do think most of the um, conditions that have been discussed this evening address most of my concerns. Right. Privacy was a major concern I have. So if there's a louver condition on any windows facing ours, I think that addresses that. And then my second request is the rooftop bar conditions. I have trouble believing there's not ever going to be any shade on our rooftop. So like I personally would love to see shading studies at different times of day, different times of the year. We don't have solar panels on our roof, but our system is defunct on the front. So we were planning to put solar and I know the city cares about, you know, green buildings. So that is a bummer. So I would like to see those shading studies and I'd like to understand the occupancy of the roof. Okay. But fundamentally, if this were continued, there's stuff for you and the applicant to talk about between now and between now and then. I would say a little bit. Most okay. of this stuff I, I feel like has been addressed. Okay. Thank you. I got commission, Vice Chair Lant, um, sorry, Vice Chair Raskin. Uh, thank you. Just a real quick question. Uh, Commissioner Lambert brought up the point earlier that the rooms in your building are not air conditioned. And uh, I think uh, the question was asked of the project applicant of whether they'd agree to install uh, air conditioning in your building or at least pay for it. And I think that they said it was a deal breaker, but just to understand the universe of possibilities, can the rooms be rehabbed to install air conditioning? Well, I will say we have a building that's along the 10 freeway, the high place buildings, and we have been putting, installing, um, portable air conditioning units. I want to say they're four or $500. Um, and it, they work really well and our residents are much happier. So, um, I think something like that would work really well here. I, I think they'll need it. They're going to have to have their windows closed. And a few of them have mentioned sensitivity to dust. You're done, sir? Okay, I'm going to give Commissioner Fonda Bernardi an opportunity to ask Wait, a when you say Fonda, uh, when you say portable air conditioners, uh, are those installed in the wall or are they standalone units it's just sitting on the floor of the unit? Yeah, actually, I, what I should have said is there are air conditioning units that you um, can install in a window um, kind of thing. So, I mean, there are some that you can just plop it into any room, but the, these are pretty small units, so I don't think we need that necessarily. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Lambert, do you happen to have a question? Me? Yeah. Um, I just want to um, reiterate what Sean asked you. Are you joking? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I just have to you just, you can't leave me alone. Um, what was I going to say? Um, <laughs> most of the conditions that we, I wrote this morning were based on the conversations you and I and Mr. Lax have had, and I don't know if you've had subsequent conversations since then, <clears throat> but do you feel that we have enough in these conditions, if we had, particularly if we had some sort of air conditioning component for your units, um, that you would be satisfied, basically? I I'm really not into continuing this, so... I, I would like to see some hours placed on the rooftop bar and some more specifics about the acoustics or no amplified music. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we're done. We're good? Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comments. We appreciate it. So at this moment is the prop appropriate time for um, the applicant to make a response, but I'm going to ask for a five-minute er, uh, break, and then we'll come back, give you guys a chance to gather your thoughts and respond to, our, to the comments you've heard. Okay. <laughs>
I'm going to ask all the commissioners to come back to their seats so we can get, get rolling. Everybody, John, uh, Sean, can we get, can we? No, I'm studying the cookies. <laughs> Bear with us. Be right back to you. Okay, we're going to call the meeting to order right now, people. The meeting is in order, please. And we're going to ask for the applicant's response to public testimony. You have three minutes to respond. Join me and chime in. Um, <clears throat> in terms of how many people are going to be up on the roof, I did some quick math up there. Our outdoor dining area, we are limited to 578 square feet, which means if you have an occupant load of 15, that means that we will have about 38 to about 50 people up there dining, more closer to 38 people. That does not <clears throat> include people just walking up there and looking at the view, okay, or the two rooms that are on the, on the far south. But the actual sitting area, we are limited to about 38, 39 people. And probably people may come in and squeeze in up to 50, but that's it, okay? The second thing is, um, <clears throat> I think we are okay, right? With, um, there's eight studio units that are facing our project, which um, we understand that during construction, that could be an issue for dust. Okay, so um, we were talking and I think we'd be willing to provide um, some sort of air conditioning units for those eight units that are facing us. Okay, okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> is there something else you want to add to that? Uh, I did quickly mention we've, um, we uh, just started talking with the, with the union earlier today, which we talked with them earlier, um, but we're gonna look forward to continuing talks with them. We think we'll get along with them well. Uh, as we move forward talking with them. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have at least one quick question for you. I, I just wondered if there were any other mitigations related to um, the traffic. I mean, I think we're gonna have a conversation about existing conditions. I'm just wondering if there are any other approaches that you can take to mitigate the conditions that we've raised relative to auto traffic bike, anything, anything at all. <laughs> I mean, we're very open to considering a lot of different options. We don't really have anything to propose at this moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, can, 
Commissioner Lambert and then Vice Chair Raskin. Hey, I've lost track. Have you met with the Mobility Division? Yes. So have they signed off or whatever it is they do on your traffic pattern? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so uh, mobility did a preliminary review. Also, a lot of the conversation was about that loading space, so they have reviewed and they didn't bring up any issues. Okay, so they're okay with it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Raskin. Yeah, thank you for uh, the commitment to provide those uh, air conditioning or filtration units for the um, uh, Community Corp building. Would you be willing to provide those for uh, units in the step-up building that are facing your property? Uh, do we know whether they actually have AC currently? We, we, I don't know that, but didn't we see they, they had blank walls on that side? Well, there are some that, some units I think that face a courtyard that faces yeah, the, that's right. That's right. the courtyard ones, are, I can't recall if those actually have windows facing or just doorway entrances. But I, I, I would have to look at the photos, I'm not sure. We can, we can um, excuse me. Um, there's the photo for you. We don't know if that would be central air conditioning that they have in there. I'm not quite sure what they have. But, you know, as, as far as the portable AC units, we'd be willing to do it there as well. But assuming they don't have AC already, which it sounds like they do not. I, just on that, I'm, AC is great in terms of the dust mitigation. Will the, I, this is, somebody may know the answer to this. Um, the way that you put the AC in the windows, do, do we need to be concerned about filtration issues? Like, do we need air filtration along with the AC? ACs work. ACs don't recirculate air from the outside to inside. They recirculate the air fully internally. Right. So if the windows are closed, that shouldn't be an issue. So that shouldn't be, we should not really have to worry about. And what about, um, yeah, I don't think there's anywhere else that we would have to worry about dust impacting. I just want to make sure that we're, and I don't know how, do we have existing construction safety codes that talk about dust mitigation in general? Like, would this be taken care of elsewhere? <laughs> this not by us? Or a form of redress, like we don't deal with it tonight, but there's a pathway if there's a dust problem that we, that was unanticipated. I, I mean, I'm, so yes, every, every new construction project of a certain threshold has to have a construction mitigation plan there's not a requirement that I'm aware of, you know, to, th th this is something the applicant is volunteering in right. terms of installing air filtration or air conditioning, to be clear. That is not something the city could require through that CMP right. um, process. There are, um, uh, you know, air quality standards that, you know, apply to construction projects through just through the air quality management district and, you know, fugitive dust and that that sort of thing. Um, but in terms of like sort of like general construction impacts because of, you know, something happening next door to you, you know, there isn't like particularly something, you know, that we require in those instances, um, you know, in terms of typical construction impacts, um, if, if you will. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get to a solution. In other words, if we say tonight that the air conditioning meets the, that that's what everybody wants, but then a resident who wasn't didn't speak up tonight has an issue. Is there a pathway for that person to go through the city or so, approach the applicant? Yeah, so, so so I think through that process, we always encourage the applicant to, you know, be a good neighbor, essentially, right? And if to, to, to the extent issues are raised, um, the project is required to have a, like, point of contact, you know, to address um, construction impacts from ongoing construction and, you know, to sort of, um, you know, work things through, you know, with, with, you know, people who may be affected by the construction, you know, even if it's not something like the city necessarily has purview over, we encourage that level of communication and, you know, trying to problem solve, um, you know, through that way. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Lambert. <laughs> um, I just wanted to confirm that you've agreed to put a break room in the basement for the employees. And there's a locker room and a bathroom as well, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now there's the portion that's, uh, I forget how it's labeled exactly, 
Um, but you know, we're also okay with doing the break room as well. Okay. There's uh, you know, sufficient space down there that's just labeled as administrative, I believe. Um, but there's space down there for a break room. And that, and that goes along with the locker shower room we talked about too, right? That the locker and the shower would be available to them as well. Yes, um, as, as we move further along in the project, that would be incorporated into what we have, the fitness area, shower area, and uh, public bathrooms. And so we will incorporate <clears throat> lockers, Great. break room for employees, yes. But you had some in the plans today. We looked at them and you said that. Yeah, I, that's right. And it looks like we we do have shower areas, and I think we have um, a line for the lockers as well too, that I see there. Yeah, but it looks like we actually need a, a a break room. But that's something I can incorporate pretty easily into the plan. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Oops. Questions? Any more questions? One, last one. one Vice Chair Raskin. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, it, we had one of the representatives from uh, one of our local building trades here tonight, and I'm curious if you've had an opportunity to uh, speak with them and uh, perhaps uh, agree to um, some of the requests that they've asked for tonight. So um, we haven't been in contact with them yet. They haven't reached out to us directly, but we're very happy to talk with them. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm gonna, I think we're done with our questions for now. I'm going to try to close the public hearing. and we're going to have some discussion. <clears throat> I am open to, and I would like Commissioner Fresco to lead this discussion. Thank you. Um, I didn't have to ask any questions because these guys were, like, really on it. Um, but basically, uh, I'm in support of most of the things I'm, uh, I guess I'm in support of all of them now because they've evolved. And uh, um, I guess I don't have anything to add. I had things to add earlier, but then they That's continued okay. to get, That's never okay. mind. Good it's all you. good. You guys did a great job. <laughs> I just have a procedural question. Uh, staff, um, we've come up with uh, the conditions that I sent you this morning, I sent to Ross, actually, I assume there, and there are others since then. How do we do that tonight? Or do you come back with a STOA or what? We have been trying to take notes. I think we could make an attempt at showing what we think we've heard. Um, yeah, my strong preference is not to come back. Yeah, Ever. I mean, we can always bring a STOA <laughs> back, but given the uh, breadth of the discussion tonight, I think it would be helpful for probably just for you to see yes. some potential language. So we're working on it. <laughs> can you put it on these little screens, or do we have to look at it up there? Um, I think it's going to get projected to that thing. Um, there's That's probably bad, a way to view it on these they, things. They've basically sure. agreed to everything I sent you guys, and you may have other stuff. That well, they had. Yeah, we're, we're, we're just sort of like rewriting it so that it's sort of, you know, in condition language. Huh? In city. In city. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> government language. I should be able to speak government language. Yeah, but I think, I think that the com while they're typing that up, commis commissioners, there's a discussion that we need to have about roof hours. Mm -hmm. Are we going to do anything with roof yes. hours? Yes, I think we should. Well, that's a discussion that we can have while they're typing up stuff. So why well, don't we? I said 8 to 10, so I don't know how other people feel. I think 10 is too early for a business yeah. to close. Okay. If we but could jump in just on the hours piece, I think it would be very helpful to clarify what you mean by the end point. Normally there is like end of service, you know, like all service ends and then full closure. Like well, There's no alcohol before you, but normally it's, you know, Let's say 10 o'clock is, you know, stop service and then 11 o'clock full closure, like vacate the deck. So I just want to make sure we understand what you mean when you say 10 o'clock. No is access that... off the roof after 11, so you have to spend the night up there. Yeah, yeah so. <laughs> yes, sir. So I think the one thing that I'm not clear on is that I should have asked, and I don't know if we can reopen the public. Wait, wait. wait. Well, you're going to bring up a new item. No, 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 no. This is about, I'm talking about hours. What's not clear to me is who's allowed on the roof. In other words, I don't believe from the and staff maybe 
I, I believe that the rooftop bar is for hotel guests and not for the public. Is that correct? I don't think. Or is the well, rooftop bar? I mean, open hotel to the public? guests can include the pu public. Could we so reopen the, just the hearing just to get that answer? It's or? not just for hotel guests. Yeah. It's for the public. Yes. Okay. So we're talking about a maximum of forty people on the roof. We're not talking about a huge number. That means we're not talking about huge ragers, right? Um, and we've addressed the amplification issue by preventing the amplification being put in the direction of either neighbor. Um, I would tend to want to turn off amplification around 10, but I don't see a need with, we're, we're talking about like 30 to 40 people. I'm not entirely clear on the need to remove them from the roof entirely much before 11 or even a little later, but I'm open to persuasion. I just, I don't see it in the downtown, in the TA, with the train going by, with everything else that's happening in that neighborhood, I'm having a hard time justifying a very tight restriction on the rooftop when we turn off the amplification at, say, 10, and, you know, there are only 40 people up there max. Well, I guess saying whatever's going on in the neighborhood does kind of overlooks the fact that there are people living on both sides of it. That's the neighborhood. So if there's noise being created by the roof because people are there at midnight, that would impact the people next door. I'm not suggesting okay, okay, guys, midnight. it's not. Let's let's hear from other commissioners. And I do want to throw in that, to, in my mind, there's a difference between Sunday through Thursday, yes. and there's a difference between Absolutely. Friday and Saturday. And I and I would like to see some some hours around those that concept. But I'm I would like to hear from other commissioners on where they're at on the hours. I think. Uh, Stopping serving at 10 and being able to be open till 11 seems normal and, you know, not nightclub-y, but certainly typical for a restaurant and what people who go to a restaurant would expect. So uh, I think that is reasonable. Um, and uh, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about our last discussion where we had to, like, list decibels for the intercom. But the applicant did bring up a good point that, you know, soft jazz is not going to really carry, whereas, you know, other kind of music will. And I know at any time of day for me personally, hearing music drifting from the distance that I can't really hear, but it's out there is super annoying. So, you know, if there's a way to, I think, the direction of the speakers is not enough that, I mean, we say no amplification, so that means that the muse sound that comes out of the speakers is as loud as an acoustic guitar, for example. You know, I mean, does it have meaning to say no amplification if you're playing the radio? Is a, you know, is a radio amplified? Does it mean anything or not? I mean, we mean something by it, but if we put it in the conditions, how do we give them the freedom to do certain things and restrict the things we don't want in language. That's what I don't want to do, but I would like to do it. Yeah, but maybe staff knows how to say those things. Hold on. Let me just ask if any other commissioners, I, Commissioner Von already has a Yeah, I, I would be comfortable with uh, uh, closing service at 10 and closing the um, the people up there by 11 for the weekdays and then on the weekends that would go from 11 to, new, to midnight basically yeah i was just uh, the case that commissioner fresco reminded me of was the santa monica brew works um where we were distinguishing between indoor and outdoor sound and we were also restricting um outdoor music uh because because that site was across from um, a number of sensitive, including residential. And I'm just. And also the train. And also the train. And I'm just wondering, we had this conversation about this is an active intersection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we put some restrictions there. And I think if, they're, if they offer us some precedent, that would be very helpful. Um, I do want to say for myself that if there are hotel guests, that would like to go up to the roof at midnight for a quiet moment, I don't have a problem with that. And so I would hate for us, I, I understand that there's no service. I, there was a conversation about the south, um, 
the south roof area which doesn't have service i want to make sure that well whatever we're however we word this we are not preventing hotel guests from very quietly going up onto the roof and smoking well, well the south side and doing whatever they want the south side has <laughs> units has has two residential units up on there. the roof on the roof yeah, yeah. okay so we don't want to prevent them from right and so i would say that this is really limited to food service and beverage service so it so then that allows the hotel guests to walk up there and enjoy the yeah the, the view yeah okay so are we comfortable with the hours that commissioner Fonamir already just threw out there i am comfortable with them I'm not seeing anybody disagree with that, so I'm taking that as a, a straw poll, yes. Can we open the public hearing to ask the applicant? No? No? Yeah. no? Yeah. We're just going to hand that us, to them? They do not think it's a good idea to have hours. Do you think they're going to come back and say, now we think these are good hours? Well, sure these are better than the ones we offered before. We That's true. Hours okay. Tuesday. Right. Um, Commissioner, Vice Chair Raskin. Uh, I, I have a point to make that's... Uh, Mostly off topic. I don't know if of hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're done with. I okay. think we're done with hours. So we're looking for conditions that were. As long as it's con condition related, and this project related, go for it. Well, I think we're, we're making good progress here, um, but you know we haven't heard from Step Up. You know we have not heard about the and Commissioner Lambert. I know you want to avoid a continuance at all costs, but Step Up is a really uniquely situated building and they have really unique needs for their residents and um, I for one would feel more comfortable continuing this discussion about crafting these conditions after having heard from them they've been contacted sure uh, they're busy and they've got a lot to do I uh, think that the points raised in mr. Susan's letter are, are really compelling uh, he's a highly respected land use attorney and I think that uh, you know, the points he's made about uh, consistency and impacts on neighboring buildings really warrants uh, making sure, you know, even if the folks at Step Up have been contacted, that we really uh, make sure that this conversation gives them an opportunity to weigh in on, on you know, molding the project in a way that uh, makes sure that their really critical community services can, can continue. Can I respond? I, the, the residents and the building manager step up with were all notified of a community meeting which no one came to and Todd has been notified so uh, my question is how long do you give someone to respond before you actually take an action um, I feel they've given the been, opportunity, been given the opportunity to do so and they haven't taken it so it, I, th I think it's time to act I, I have to say I tend to agree with that We've, we there has been notice there was public meetings um, Commissioner Landers. Yeah, I know, I know the applicant asked to not have this year or two review period, but I actually think that that's the solve, is that as long as we have that that year to two year review period on the CUP that we've done before, that gives step up ample opportunity to respond if an issue emerges and to be heard by us. Because if it's a suffi sufficiently severe issue, um, that will be brought to us and we would reopen the CUP. I don't, I, I agree with Commissioner Lambert and Chair, I, 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 they've been given an opportunity to, to respond and one of the neighbors responded and one of the neighbors didn't and we have to go with the information we have. And that neighbor who responded got a lot of, got yeah. a lot of love from us. Mm -hmm. And it's the other neighbor's going to get the same love, so. Okay. <clears throat> so, sorry, that didn't seem to go over. Do you have another, any other? Uh, no, I'll just say for the record that I, I uh, agree with the points raised in Mr. Sisson's letter, and um, I'll, uh, I'll end my comments there. Okay. Any other conditions, folks, that we have not <laughs> beaten on? I have no idea. Are we going to get the... the Jing is working on doing a, a, the conditions. I think I know what I'm doing, but we'll see, you know, yeah. <laughs> Join the club. So just We should just, all not know what we're doing like Jing does. That's right. For clarity, in this particular case, we are, ex we are extending the review period scope 
to include not just the restaurant operation hours, but <laughs> we're looking at circulation impacts. And there was one other thing. What was it? Well, like cars backing up into the street. They've told us that the cars won't back up into the street, but if they're suddenly backing up into the street, I'd like to, okay. I'd like to have it come back because that's a real, or yeah, we start hearing that residents can't get out of CCSM or a step up parking. We need to know. Okay. So um, I just want to make sure we're covering the scope of the review is clearly defined. Well, it's, it's, and it, and it could be things that we're not even right, just focused on yet. And, and finally, I want to say for the record, as much as I'd love to preserve the palm tree, and I'm happy to vote for preserving the palm tree, it's a grass, people. It's not a tree. It's very important to me. The palm tree? Yes. I mean, put it in my front yard. <laughs> I love palm weeds. Uh, OK. OK, so here we go. Um, so these are new conditions based on um, what uh, Con Commissioner Lambert was raising and then all the other discussion that's happened tonight. So this first one is about uh, temporary screening materials. So it's really the language in red, um, you know, that you want to take a look at. And hopefully everyone can, can see this. Um, so temporary screening materials shall be constructed on the borders of the patio areas to the extent necessary to provide privacy for the residents at 502 Colorado Avenue and shall remain in place until the newly installed landscaping has matured to provide privacy for the residents at 502 Colorado. We don't need it for 520? No, because there's no patios facing okay. here. No, there, there's nothing there. Okay. Um, the next part is about um, the palm tree. So again, the red language, as part of the project's construction management plan, the applicant agrees to have the existing palm tree located nearest a common property line and located on the adjacent 502 Colorado Avenue property assessed by a licensed arborist to determine whether the tree can be preserved in place. If determined that the tree cannot be retained in conjunction with the construction of the project, the applicant shall identify a replanting site if available and shall coordinate for the tree's relocation or removal at no expense to the owners of 502 Colorado Avenue. Take out if available. Because I know there are palm tree adoption agencies all over the place. <laughs> I, I Googled it, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're not called that, but it's a bit. <laughs> okay. Okay, the next one is about the uh, mitigation of noise from the rooftop area. The applicant shall implement to the extent reasonably necessary to mitigate noise along the roof level terrace, additional landscaping, use of glass material, or the use of sound attenuating materials. Just for clarity, are you replacing the first sentence? Because the first sentence is good to mitigate noise and objects being thrown onto the edges. We need to keep that first sentence. The, in black. She's really yeah. worried about things being thrown. Because yeah. so you rewrote the right, previous paragraph. This right. one is an addition. So while the, while the planning manager is doing that, just to clarify, so the black, lang the black lettering is, is the original condition. Mm -hmm. The red lettering is staff's recommendation in order to turn it into city ease, as you mentioned, so that it gets integrated into the STOA written in similar language as other conditions. So can we write it in a way that says something about the safety to prevent falling objects, whether they're self-propelled or otherwise? <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to add this, basically? Um, yes. Perfect. Yes, yeah, perfect. I, I'm just a little concerned about shall implement to the extent reasonably necessary. I mean, who determines that? I mean, I think we just want to see it happen. So I would take that out. So I'll mitigate noise and objects. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And there was some concern in our original conversation about how tall this could be legally. Just what it could. And I kind of, I kind of think that we're allowed 84 feet. That building or the rooftop was at 71 feet. So that, that wall can go. The rooftop deck was at about 71 feet, and the overall height allowed us. Yeah, but there'd be no view yeah, if you had really a 13 needs foot to wall. Be five feet, though, that's like above most people's <clears throat> eye line. And those nets are transparent. Yeah. So yeah. we've added some. Yep. We've allowed some. Oh, sorry. We've allowed. We've added some. Uh, but not the observation deck, because people won't have anything to see. So here, just this is the applicant shall mitigate noise 
and objects being thrown onto adjacent properties uh, along the roof level terrace through, providing. oh, by providing, sorry, I'm missing words here, by providing additional landscaping, use of glass material, or the use of sound attending materials to the extent allowed by law. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm so not sure about the next one. There's no sun in that quack. Um, yeah, so number eight, like, yeah, I think there's been discussion whether you want to want to include this. It occurred to us, you know, landscaping really is a, it's an ARB purview, and so this was just a suggestion that the ARB pay particular attention to the landscape materials along the western side property line that would enhance overall privacy to the adjacent property. For the adjacent property. Commissioner Fauna Bernardi. Yeah, I think that's a tough one because uh, we, we really don't understand First of all, we're planting on the neighbor's property. So, and we don't know and understand whether there's subterranean garage there, whatever, what, what's going on there. Um, so I think, you know, I think we would, let's, let's take that one out. I, I'm, so we'll, we'll delete this condition. Right. Okay. You can tell Never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's stop chatting. Uh, yeah. Chatting Jing in the middle of her presentation. <laughs> it's all important stuff. Yeah. Okay. So um, the next one is about the um, what was originally talking about like frosting the windows. And I think out of here was uh, operable louvers shall be installed on any hotel units that are directly opposite to windows on the adjacent property located at 502 Colorado Avenue. There's only one hotel room that is in that there's category. Eight. Are there? There's eight windows, I thought he said. No, oh, no, because there's only one bathroom window that's exposed in the CCSM project. Operable louver shall be installed on the exterior of any hotel room windows. Why put it on the exterior? Yeah, so that was the whole idea. The guest can't control it. Oh. It's like a thing. Basically, the idea of the louver, because it's a louver, so you get light and you can see out in one oh, direction. But okay. you can't see oh, okay. Oh, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any issues? There's only one hotel room that has a direct relationship with a window at 502. Well, let them figure it out. All right, okay. Yeah, I was aware of that. Can I ask, the change that was made by the, so the applicant addressed an ARB concern that indirectly addressed this for 520 because they're putting in some, they're, they're doing something on the north side, I think, that will create additional privacy relative to 520, mm -hmm. um, but I think we probably want to memorialize that in a condition as well, because it was, it was, it's the new plan post ARB. I'm not sure. Yeah. But it's not a, it's not a louver. It, the, the solution on the other side is something else. It's like landscaping. It's, that, landscape, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a hanging. Is it plan. already shown in the project plans? Because if it is they would be required to comply with Maintain that. it? Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. It, so this wording, this louvers That's condition fine. is yeah. fine? Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. There's also no, no. Um, maybe you already had that, no idling automobiles. Is that somewhere else? We're, we're getting to that. Okay. okay. Right. So then, um, then the next one is about the compliance report. Um, the applicant shall fly, file a compliance report within, I think I heard, one year. Um, after certificate of occupancy to review the effectiveness of and level of compliance with the terms and conditions of this CEP approval. After submittal of the compliance report, staff shall either set the matter for a public hearing, which is noticed in the same manner as the original permit application, or submit the compliance report to the Planning Commission as an information item to enable the Planning Commission to determine whether a public hearing is necessary upon review of the compliance report at this public hearing, if any, the Planning Commission may add or revise terms and conditions to the extent necessary to ensure effective conditions of approval. Yeah. Uh, can we say between one year and 18 months? Within one year, they could do it the day after they open. So I would, like to spe I would like to specify that it's between a year and 18 months so that there's been enough time for a full, you know, they have a six month window to file it, but it has to be after at least a year. Yeah. After I sure yeah. ask him, and uh, so I, I, I like I like this. 
Um, I'm a little bit concerned that if we're tying this to CFOs, that it's going to miss potential construction impacts. So perhaps we can tie it to maybe both CFOs and building permits. Well, this is different, right? So if I may respond, those are two different issues, right? The, the, the issue here is they need to go a year after CFO to deal with the operational. Is the, are the hours of the bar, the, 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 right, all of those pieces, the traffic, all, excuse me, all that stuff. The construction is a whole other matter, and so it should be a separate, it should be tied to separate conditions and on a separate timeline, if you want to do that. So, Just yeah, to be clear, yeah. too, this this language is from the code, and it's specifically related to CUPs. Mm -hmm. But right. it sounds like what you're concerned with is more related to potentially the DRP, the construction side. Right, and and, and I think to clarify, those conditions are enforced and monitored throughout. You know, so even during like they, they, again, they're required to have and filed a construction management plan if they're found in violation. You know, that is dealt with through the enforcement process, whether through code enforcement or building and safety or public works, as the case may be, because um, they have, you know, a temporary traffic construction plan. This project, due to its proximity to the Metro line, is also, you know, going to have to coordinate with Metro's requirements for um, construction proximity, you know, to the train line. So there's, um, you know, several layers of, of review that happen, and they're required to conform with that, with that CMP. And, and also, there's a we have a condition that they have to mitigate the privacy with temporary measures until the landscaping has matured. It's up there. It's and, right. No, what I'm saying is this that could be even you know what if it takes two years? That's going to be enforced through traditional enforcement. This has to do with the operation. This has to do with other operational stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the um, this additional, again, as part of the project, this is about the air conditioning units as part of the project's construction management plan. The applicant agrees to install air conditioning units in the eight studio units at 502 Colorado Avenue and the units at 520 Colorado Avenue that directly face the proposed project and do not have air conditioning in order to mitigate construction impacts. I would suggest any units at 520 or those units at 520, just so it's clear. And um, in the past with stuff like this, we've put it into the project description when it's volunteered by the applicant. Um, and I would feel comf I would like to have that in the project description. Since with the, we used to do this with the, um, the, the temporary, with the uh, short-term housing, and we had a sentence at the end that said, as volunteered by the applicant, yeah, such I, and such will happen. And I think, you know, you, you could do it either way. I think it's easier to enforce when it's here. In this case, the applicant has volunteered okay. it up, you know, and it's just sometimes easier when it's in the list as opposed to in the project description. Okay. I think it's just a matter of practice we've moved towards Whatever's, if volunteering it. Yeah. We trust they're going to do it, so... Okay, um, then into the project operations, this is about the hours of the rooftop restaurant and bar. Um, so you, again, the red language, the operating hours of the rooftop bar and restaurant shall be limited as follows, Sunday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. with full closure by 11 p.m., Friday and Saturday, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. with full closure by midnight. That's what we talked about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, then the next one is no, the, about the amplified music. All forms of speaker amplification utilized on the roof level terrace shall be directed away from the adjacent residential properties. Can we make that any adjacent residential properties? There are only two. Today there are only two. Yeah, that's true. And then finally, um, the idling automobiles, the hotel operators shall implement a requirement and post signage prohibiting idling combustion automobiles on the property. Combustion. Yeah, why combustion? What are the kind of EVs because can idle? Are, they're EVs can idle. They they're EVs, silent they're and stinkless. Okay. He's just cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I. Do EVs have oh, you're right. Right. If I may. As someone, um, there you go. Uh, 
as someone who lives near a property that on the regular blocks traffic, um, I would love to see signage as well prohibiting blocking traffic. Well, how do you do that? Uh, you put up a sign that says, that you put up a sign for the Ubers or the Lyfts or the taxis or whoever's dropping yeah. off that says, no stopping in the roadway. Gotcha. Okay. It may not be, in, I mean, in the public right yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, they, we cannot require them to put signage in the public right away. I'm not sure where. Well, in the same place, they put it on their own property line. But you would, you could put it in the same place that says no idling. It's facing the street on their property. But I deal with this all the time, and it's a problem. <laughs> so since this might um potentially impact the public right of way i think we would recommend as the planning manager is typing out and suggesting that there would be some consultation with the mobility division and public works on something like that just sure. to ensure that's fine you know fyi it, just it is all it is all red zone too and in theory that's a sign <laughs> in theory and if people are going to listen to the red zone they hopefully will I know I have the same issue. Post a traffic person out there all the time, twenty four hours a day. Fast food restaurant would be good for that, that backs up and Are people sit <laughs> in the right lane on Pico. This Colorado Avenue, right? Okay. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah. Something. Traffic and cyclist access on Colorado Avenue. From blocking and cyclist access. Yeah. Are you like anti skateboard and pedestrian? <laughs> scooters, scooters, skateboards. <laughs> Mobility. Mobility. Vehicles, right? yeah. Is there a bike lane? No. It's a Sharrows. No. There's a bike lane westbound. Okay, that's it, right? Um, there was one about uh, confirming that the Lockers were available to both guests and employees, and that there would be a break room. Okay. Like a that break room? Break room. Okay. Huh? I think you're right with the lockers in the, in the, I believe you're right. What, what is it? The applicant agrees. In a break room. Sorry, I didn't hear that. They agreed to it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Could you please restate the second part? So the beginning, the this employee break room and in lockers for employees, and then there's access to certain facilities, ensuring that those are available to employees. Is yeah, that, that the, the bikes, part? bike, bike uh, parking and shower. Was it bike parking and showers? Yes. Had e equitably available to employees and guests? The bike, okay. Employee. And in. Okay. Oh. Lockers available too. Agrees to provide an employee and lockers. Oh, available. Is it there? It will be. Okay. Commissioners, we are we are getting. It seems like we are triangulating on a on a motion here, and we're going to have a vote very soon. And I'm just going to say for discussion, I'm still pretty torn about pretty torn about this project. I will say that I love the architecture. I think the architect does a great job, and that this is a really tough a tough site. And his design and his sensitivity to the neighbors should really be commended. And I do want to commend you for that. But the access, that, I mean, I'm, I'm having to sit here in front of my computer and look from a Google Street View of how narrow this street is right in front of this site. And in my mind, it just calls for no curb cuts. But then we hear from the resident next door who says, the alley's a nightmare. How can we use the alley? 
And I don't really know what, I mean, I'm kind of tied up in knots. I, I don't want to access this from the front. I don't want to access it from the back. I mean, here's, I'm a fairly pro-development guy, and I can't figure out how to like the access to this site. Commissioner Fond of Arnie. First of all, let me, let me second that, that uh, this is a very difficult site. This is the kind of project you would see in Tokyo where they lower in, you know, even the bicycles are in vertical stacks going, you know, into the ground. Uh, it's that kind of a, you know, 41, just all you have to say is 41 feet, 9 inches. That explains this whole project. Um, so it's very well integrated and it's made like a, like a little piece, a Jenga piece, so that if you remove one piece, the whole thing would collapse. And so we want to make sure to leave all the pieces in the right place. Uh, specifically, the piece that the city has already provided looking at this from 10,000 feet is we're actually building another axis of hotels running away from the beach. It starts at the Wyndham, then there's those two hotels right across the uh, light rail station, and this one would be the fourth one of another axis. And that's pretty amazing that, you know, because everyone's pressed on the beach, and we're building one going the other way, which is really valuable for our city to have that. Uh, these are very small rooms. Uh, and there's no no problem with that. If people want to have small rooms with great views, that's extra visual space. Uh, it's amazingly highly, uh, let's say, transit provided. There's a huge bus hub right there on 5th in Colorado. There's a light rail coming the other way. There's the bike paths going in both directions. Of course, there's cars everywhere. And the freeway is like a stone's throw away. So, you know, in terms of location, location from a transit side, this is a premium space, and this is where, in these premium spaces, you want the higher density, uh, you know. And the architect, I think, has done everything they can to avoid impacting the neighbors. I think there will be some shading along the edges of the, uh, you know, Santa Monica Community Court project. I think that's unavoidable. Uh, but this project is essentially northeast of them, so it has less impact. The biggest impact will be on the step up on project in terms of shading. Until we get a solar ordinance, there's nothing we can do about that. So uh, what I'm saying is that to lay to rest uh, your concerns about that curb cut, as the traffic engineer mentioned it, that curb cut is whatever it is, 70, 80 feet away from the intersection of 5th, and it's one way in, in Colorado. So the speed of acceleration, cars are not screaming by that curb cut. There are no parked cars. One of the problems you have when you have curb cuts with parked cars, people can't see them. This one is a bare piece of sidewalk. There's red all the way along. You just see that cut in the red plus any signage. So I think the curb cut is not a problem. The exiting is also not a problem because you come out, everybody comes out to that intersection of 5th and Colorado, which is signalized, and that's the bicycles, the tracks, the buses and the cars, so it's a relatively safe intersection. So in some ways, I don't think we can do better than this. So I think we can put our fears to rest about the, the circulation problems. I think it works. So that's it. That's my comment. But it does re raise another fear, <laughs> which is uh, going forward, we have uh, incentivized a lot of new really tall buildings in our downtown that will be going up adjacent to existing buildings and we don't have objective standards about privacy across windows between units and you know there could be other issues in the future that uh, are unaddressable for tenants in the future where there's housing next to housing so i mean the hope we is can't. I mean, I hear you loud and clear, but that's not before us. I know. Right? I'm just saying that I realize this could be, you know, a harbinger of the future. Well, I think, can I respond to that? Yeah. I think the harbinger also goes the other way, that this developer has been supremely responsive to the neighbors and almost sets the gold standard of how to insert these very large projects in tight spaces and mitigate the impact as much as possible to the neighbors. So even though we might that's not be able... to get a DRP. 
Well, again, we, even if we can't get another developer to do the same level of mitigation, we can point to that and say, this is what we'd like to see. And so it gives us leverage because they set the bar. Well, we point to it. It's all staff reviewed. I'm talking about housing projects. <laughs> well, anyway, it's not okay, okay. today. I, well, it's not a housing Vice chair, project. Vice chair, asking. Could we, um, we're discussing. There is no motion, is there? No. There, we're just discussing. All right. Well, for the sake of uh, getting us to call the question, I'll move that we continue this item. No, I'll, I'm, I'm moving to continue the item. He wants to continue. Is there a second for a continue? Second. To continue the item? Oh, did you say continue? Yeah. He yeah. said it twice. <laughs> <laughs> is there a second for a continuance? No. no. There is not a second. That motion fails. You almost heard me, Ellis. Hook, line, sink us. Can we, is there another motion out there? I move that we approve this project with the conditions that have been enumerated. Second. Second. Isn't there a CEQA exemption to? Yeah. Well, there's there's yeah. five motions we ultimately have to take, yeah. apparently, but it gives we, us. You have to, yeah. We have to. The, do we have to do I mean, we got a maybe? sense of where the commit, let's. The first one we have to do is adopt the findings for the CEQA exemption. We can do it all again. So moved. If you'd like, you could take them all at once, unless you think that there would be um, certain ones that would be approved and certain ones that wouldn't. But if you think that the whole package would, would go under one motion, it could be made under one motion, including the STOA. Okay. I, I stand corrected, and then let's work. We have a motion. We have a motion by a fond minority. Do, who seconded it? I did. Okay. Lambert seconded it. I just wanted to say one thing. We yeah. never... Uh, mentioned the minor mod in any of the discussions, <laughs> but I just wanted to, <laughs> to say for the record that I think it's uh, it's fine that it would be impossible to do this project or any project probably without it. So that's all. <laughs> I thought it was important to uh, acknowledge it. If I may, yet another reason why many minor mods should stay at the staff approval level. Well, it's just because we got the DRP. That's the only reason it came. Okay. <laughs> so, st staff, is there anything more you need to show us that you were? No, not not unless you had more conditions. Can you, can you or conditions something. that we yeah. want to add. Yeah. So everything we just went through. Okay. I believe we have we have beaten this horse. <laughs> I believe it is time to call for the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner Fonda-Bernardi? Yes. Commissioner Fresco? Yes. Commissioner Lambert? Yes. Commissioner Landris? Yes. Commissioner Tolkien? Yes. Vice Chair Raskin? No. And Chair Reese? I'm going to vote yes on this, and I'm going to just highlight that Commissioner Fonda-Bernardi made very salient <laughs> arguments to me, and I want that to go down, that Commissioner Fonda-Bernardi talked to Commissioner Reese <laughs> into approving a project. <laughs> I think that my reasons for voting no are on the record, but if people want more clarity, I can give it. I don't think it's necessary at this point. It's up to you. It's up no. to you. That's okay. fine. Okay. Then that's it. Project's approved. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate everybody's input. Thank you, Ross. <clears throat> Okay, moving on in our agenda. Going from 11B, we go to 12, and we have nothing on resolutions. We do have three written communications that hopefully you have all reviewed prior to coming in. Uh, we don't have, well, we have number 14. Are there any planning commissioner discussion items that we want to add for future? Um, do we have the on record that we want livable communities to make a? We did. We okay. did that last time. Okay. I, I have one. Um, I was surprised to see um, these medians coming in on Pico, and I don't remember when. I don't remember their relationship to planning with the Pico Wellbeing Project or with other mobility issues, and so I'd just like to renew my request for 
a full briefing on where we are with pet action and bike action, um, primarily because when we were having conversations about PICO some time ago, I was told that it was not bike laneable, for example, because of the lane width issues having to do with city buses and city fire. Um, and now I'm seeing these medians going in in the middle that seem to really make two lanes narrow or potentially go down to one lane, which I don't remember being noticed to the community. So I think we need to just get that, get some air and light on that conversation sooner rather than later, because this feels like it's a bit abrupt. Yeah, um, it may well be all great, but we just need to get that aired out a bit. We could definitely do that. I, I also noticed it seemed like they're modifying the medians. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what's they're going They're changing on. the cross. The, the, they're, they're doing the crosswalk so when you walk across, you have to turn your body and see the oncoming cars. Mm -hmm. That's how I see the, that's what I see going in there. And pedestrian, what are they called? Um, respites or islands mid, mid crossing, but they are taking space away from those lanes and it's a little, I don't want to get into a discussion because it's not on the agenda. We just need a briefing. <laughs> yeah. Um, j j just so you know, um, mobility is, they're, they're very busy. So they are scheduled on in August uh, 16th is when we were able to, you know, given everything that's going on, that that's when they are due to come and give an update to the Planning Commission. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay. Can I, um, as we adjourn, are we ready to, it? I would like to, um, adjourn with best wishes to Jing um, in a celebratory way. So um, congratulations. Uh, you're rid of us for at least six months. <laughs> and uh, um, <laughs> and really, we wish you all the we wish you all the best and um, look forward to meeting your um, new staff assistant, your, your, your current staff assistant and your new <laughs> staff assistant in the future. Well, we got to hear the other We did. Staff she had staff quite assistants bit. quite regularly during, during the yeah, Zoom time. So <laughs> your co coworker post, hashtag my coworker. <laughs> and Steve, I'll miss your child's drawings in the background too. <laughs> Thank you. You'll be you'll be in wonderful hands with with Roxanne. So, <laughs> of course we will. But we'll still miss you, and we thank you, and we will adjourn the meeting. It is. If I had my glasses on, I would tell you that it is nine fifty eight, and we are adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>